If Pastor John Anderson could please come forward from Bay Presbyterian Church and lead us with the invocation this morning. Let's bow for prayer. A great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great place in which we live, for this great nation, for this great city. We pray for the prosperity of this city. We thank you for our first responders and ask your blessing on them. Give them safety and success in their mission. We pray for our nation's military. God, we pray for your blessing on this community and for these who represent us. We pray for today courage, for integrity, for peace. We pray for, the, for prosperity to, for, to follow all the citizens. We make our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Councilwoman Carr, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, sir. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilwoman Carumba? Here. Councilman DeWitt? Here. Councilwoman Carr? Here. Mayor Simmons? Here. Councilman O'Flynn? Here. Councilman Gibson? Here. Councilman Forbes? Here. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning Mayor. And um, hope everybody's doing well. We are going to open up this morning with public comment on agenda items. Members of the public that would like to speak on agenda items only, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rex Sims. I'm a member of the LPA and one of the original incorporation members of this city. After becoming a city, we had to had two years to generate a comp plan that was suitable for the state, which we employed a couple of uh, brothers to write a plan, and that's what we had was just a plan. It takes more than just words on paper to make it work. And fortunately, we've had uh, several skilled people that helped us in this project, and the city in the beginning hired Jim LaRue, which led us in the beginning path of uh, building a comp plan that was uh, suitable for a city of our size. Uh, the city council appointed uh, Larry Warner, a very outstanding man, to head up the LPA for many years. He did an outstanding job. And the third thing, the council uh, hired Audrey Vance, a city attorney, an attorney that was very familiar with, uh, with the comp plan and uh, zoning and uh, land use uh, rules. We worked together for uh, many years, uh, not always in complete agreement, but uh, we've always had the skilled, knowledgeable hands. We've accomplished much, and yet the comp plan is still intact. We, and you have no idea how often it is challenged. I witnessed many very skillful land attorneys attempting to make the plan say things it doesn't say. And I've always been confident that the city would team led by Audrey Vance would get it right and uh, protect what we hold dear, the city that we all love. I wonder why, how a part-time attorney can cope with the level of knowledge and skills, especially when working for the lowest dollar. I pray for our beloved city. There are four major land use problems that I have great concerns about that are going to be addressed in sometime in the future. The Weeks Fish Camp, the Rapture Bay Fish Five Acres, the DRGR Roads and Development, and the Annex Mine on Benita Grand Road. Uh, my mother, who I learned is usually right, used to say, be careful what you wish for, you may get it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rex. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Debbie Giambo. I live on Bel Rio Drive off of West Terry. And first, I'd like to thank you um, for the opportunity to speak with you, as well as all of the work that you do on our behalf. Um, as you know, at the last city council meeting, there were three students from Bonita Springs Middle School who came to talk with you about the issue of crosswalks on West Terry, the lack of crosswalks on West Terry, and the lack of safe passage along West Terry as they go to and from school. Um, they wanted to come to talk with you because they were shocked and disappointed that at the previous city council meeting, the city council had approved Alta's plan for West Terry, which included specifics about width and location of bicycle and pedestrian pathways on the north side of West Terry, but no specifics about the location or number of crosswalks that would be installed as part of that plan 
and absolutely no information about safe passage to those crosswalks on the south side of West Terry, despite the fact that according to my count, if it's accurate, there are 20 residential streets that intersect with West Terry on the, west, on the south side and one that intersects on the north side in the area that, you, that Alta's plan covers. Um, so I decided to come back to talk with you today because I saw on your agenda that item 8C involves discussion of proposed issues for the May 22nd City Council workshop and item 9A involves discussion of the land development code and specifically listed there are bicycle and pedestrian facilities. I wish and I hope that you would take one of those opportunities or another one very soon because as we both, as we all know, Alta's plan has to move along quickly because of the funding sources. But I, I, I implore you to take one of those opportunities to discuss the specifics of the number and location of crosswalks on, less, on West Terry as well as safe passage on the south side of West Terry which will probably, could look like a, so a sidewalk to those crosswalks. I don't see how children going to and from school can get to crosswalks on their bicycles in the ditches that are on the south side of West Terry unless they're riding next to traffic. This needs to move along quickly, as you know, so I implore you to take advantage of the opportunities that you have at this meeting, as well as in the near future, to discuss those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Other members of the public that would like to speak, please come forward. Vincent, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Mayor. <clears throat> good morning, Council. <clears throat> um, my name is Vince Motorelli, and uh, I have been a uh, volunteer and uh, have worked in Bonita Springs since 2004. Um, and today is a happy occasion for me. Uh, it is my one year anniversary uh, working for Habitat for Humanity full time. So uh, after 23 years in newspaper, uh, I've been doing this for one year and it's been the best year of my life. I want to talk a little bit about Habitat for Humanity. Our mission is bringing people together to build homes, communities, and hope. And nowhere is that more evident than Bonita Springs, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> since 1982, our Lee County affiliate has built over 1,500 homes and sold them at an affordable mortgage to working families. Uh, our largest donor base and our most cohesive volunteer groups are your neighbors and constituents in Bonita Springs. Uh, Mayor Simmons, your neighborhood alone built three homes this year. Um, through funding and volunteers. There's a group of 50 or so that call themselves the Nail Pounders of Bonita Bay. And uh, all they want to know is where they're going to build next. And so um, your churches, they pass the plate, they pick up a hammer, um, as do your clubs. Uh, you see it with uh, our partnership with the Rotary Club of Bonita Springs and their involvement in our disaster recovery plan. Um, <clears throat> I'll say that the nowhere in our area do we see the ferocity of volunteerism as in Bonita, and that makes our model work. But I will also say that nowhere in our area is it more expensive to build. And in Bonita, impact fees are the single largest payment associated with new home construction. We're building 64 homes this year, 40 new and 24 rehabs, but we can only build five in Bonita Springs, um, although we own plenty of lots, and we know that the need in Bonita is great. So we understand that infrastructure is costly, and everyone has to share in this cost. Uh, but this will reduce the number of homes that Habitat for Humanity can build for families in need because it will increase the cost of each home, uh, this being the uh, uh, increase in impact fees. So we ask you to please consider alternatives that would have less impact on affordable housing, things like making the impact fees based on a home square footage uh, so that small affordable homes pay less or uh, establishing a fund that can be used to reimburse impact fees for affordable housing or even deferring impact fees until the first homeowner sells. Uh, and then the fees can be repaid from sales proceeds from a presumably appreciated uh, home sale. So um, there are many different alternatives to help affordable housing, and I would just ask you to consider those as you move forward with your impact fee uh, uh, increase. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. Morning. Good morning, Mayor, Council. My name is Chris Magnus. I'm with Nelson's Plaza. We are consent agenda E this morning. We're here if you have any questions, um, be happy to answer them. Otherwise, we appreciate your approval for the uh, pre-approved grant from a different council. Thank you very much. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Morning, Ed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Fitzgerald. I come to speak about item 6F of the uh, Employment Transition Plan for uh, Audrey Vance. Um, my recommendation is that we hire a full-time independent lawyer as soon as possible. Uh, Mrs. Vance brings to the current transition period her prejudices and, and her relationships with uh, businesses and practices that I believe have not been in the best interest of Benita Springs. Um, I believe an educated independent attorney uh, is the best thing that can happen to, to Benita Springs right now. I'm not too sure why you would be worried about a transition period when you're bringing in a, a competent, educated attorney to replace Mrs. Vance. Excuse me, my Mr. Mayor. Uh, my recommendation just a again. Point, just a point of order. Um, we do have a First Amendment. We're entitled to say what we'd say, but it is a civil dialogue that we try to encourage here, if I might. Absolutely. Tell me where I was out of order. You were quoting that I'm out of order, and I said something out of order. Tell me what it is. No, no, I was making a point. Well, I don't get your point. Um, I'm entitled to have an opinion. I'm expressing an opinion. I'm, I'm advising you to bring in a full-time attorney. Please to tread lightly. Thank you, Ed. I am threading lightly. Okay. Thank you. I am. Okay. Appreciate that. I am finished, too. Okay. Uh, I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Morning, John. Good morning, Mayor, Honorable, Honorable Mayor and Council. Um, again, uh, like I like to start, I'd like to thank you all for what you do for us. Um, I'd like to address uh, agenda item number 8A, uh, and I'm a, a bit concerned that um, uh, in forming that vision and plan, uh, we're <laughs> the zoning board may choose to um, freeze all development in Old Downtown um, until something is adopted. Uh, just yesterday, they uh, decided to postpone moving an important downtown project forward. Um, they decided to postpone it until council approval. Um, this was done actually against uh, advice from legal counsel at the time, according to the video uh, that I watched. Uh, I saw legal counsel advise that uh, this could be passed on contingent of the council's passing it. Um, and so I wonder why the delay. Um, I respectfully ask the City Council um, to move and fast track projects forward instead of um, letting them get delayed or slowed down. Let's get them fast tracked, please. Secondly, agenda item number 9C. Uh, as a business owner downtown, uh, as a business owner downtown and a representative of the Benita Springs Downtown Alliance. I represent nonprofits, neighborhood groups, and the local businesses. We all are concerned that raising impact fees will slow development out downtown and put affordable housing for Benita residents out of reach. We're concerned at this, the taxes lost from uh, these empty city downtown lots. We know that our tax base would drastically improve once development starts in downtown. Um, we spent more than just $3 million for the road. We bought the Wonder Gardens. Um, so there's been a lot of money spent. We wanted, we've heard the council wants to draw downtown anchors to downtown. Well, how is that going to happen if they're watching what is going on with the developers now downtown? I'm reminded of a movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And to paraphrase Jimmy Stewart, is it too much to ask that people can build a home, work, live, and die in the same place? He did not think so, and neither do I. Please don't raise the impact fees. Thank you, John. Morning, Kathy. Well, good morning, everyone. For the record, Kathy McGrath. The first thing I want to comment on is um, on the consent agenda. The gentleman just spoke, uh, item uh, 6E, about uh, their, a grant. And I just told him he was not aware. And some of you are aware that Bob and I built Nelson Plaza in 1979. And, you know, things were different back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And some of you might remember Chuck Winders and Sundial Drugs and uh, South Florida Cablevision had the whole back building. And, of course, nobody knew the McGrath, so Nelson's had the hardware store next door, so we named it Nelson Plaza. But I saw the pictures in the green sheet, and I'm excited about it because, you know, that was our baby. And the next thing is... Uh, 
John Paino kind of said it all. I'm not going to repeat because it's, he said it so much better. But you know, we have been looking for redevelopment to start in downtown Bonita for so long. Look, Mosaic's going to get started soon when that gets moved, uh, Longitude, the library groundbreaking is there. So all I'm asking you, I don't understand why the um, zoning board didn't pass that against the uh, advice of their attorneys, but don't throw a monkey wrench into plans that Tony, and I really don't know him personally, but he's a known entity, he's been successful. Don't throw a monkey wrench in, into all the money and plans that he has done for the last three years. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Other members of the public that would like to speak? Don Thompson, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here for a, a couple seconds. I'm Don Thompson for the record, and I'm with the law firm of Henderson, Franklin, Starnes, and Holt here in Bonita Springs. But I'm here today as chairman of the Bonita Springs Estero Economic Development Council. Um, and here to address item 8A, downtown 041 redevelopment. The reconstruction looks great so far. Uh, I find myself driving out of my way to go downtown and, and to admire it. And also hopefully to be surprised and excited by what happens next. Um, I truly believe that it's far better than I ever expected, and council and every, everybody involved in that project needs to be congratulated. You can literally feel the excitement. Please keep the momentum going. I fear that some may be uncertain as to what division is. We're not here to tell the city what division should be, but we are here to urge the city to keep the excitement and momentum moving forward. If there's uncertainty about the vision, let's figure it out quickly and move forward full steam ahead. We support the deputy mayor's suggestions to set out a clear and aggressive timetable of not just nailing down the vision, but let's accomplish it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Don. Other members of the public that would like to speak? Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Penny Kapler. I live at 24833 Lakemont Cove Lane in Bonita Springs. I am a resident here. Um, I have been donating a lot of my time to the cleaning of the Imperial River after Irma, and I work as an eco-tour guide on the Imperial River, and I also am apprenticing doing the historical tours. I love this little town. This little town to me, the way it's going on, it's the only walkable town around there other than Naples. But you can park your car, you can go and have a little lunch. There are so many activities in the park. I too, as a resident here, get many questions from people who not only take the tours, but um, both different types of tours, but are very eager. They're delighted with what's transpired so far, but they're very eager to have it continue. Um, I, I sincerely hope that, that it does. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Other members of the public that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Council, what's your pleasure? Move to approve. Second. Then a motion to approve and a second. Further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilman DeWitt? Aye. Councilwoman Carr? Aye. Mayor Simmons? Aye. Councilman O'Flynn? Aye. Councilman Gibson? Aye. Councilman Forbes? Aye. Councilwoman Carumbo? Aye. Okay, wonderful. We are going to move on to proclamations and presentations. I'm gonna go off the board here for a minute. Carl Schwing, if you could come forward, please. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is a letter yeah, it is a long one. <laughs> we actually needed about 10 pages, but we, we whittled it down to one, Carl. Uh, this is a letter dated May 16th, 2018, to Mr. Carl Schwing, City Manager, City of Bonita Springs, 
9101 Bonita Beach Road, Bonita Springs, Florida, 34135. Dear Carl, on behalf of the entire city council, we congratulate you on your retirement. I think many of us are jealous that you get to retire. We thank you for your dedication and commitment to the city of Bonita Springs. Your hard work and professionalism are an inspiration, and we truly appreciate how you guided the city of Bonita Springs for the past seven years. The vast experience garnered over the 23 years before you joined us, the knowledge you shared with us for your experience, nine years in Cape Coral and 16 years prior to that in a variety of Florida and Missouri cities became our advantage. Your involvement in economic development efforts, including industrial revenue bond financing, tax increment financing, CRAs, the redevelopment of a dying one anchor mall in the premier 1.2 million square foot Galleria Mall in St. Louis. Remember that one? I do. I don't, but I love hearing that. And, and more recently, the use of return on investment ROI to determine and offer development incentives has aided us in a time where the city of Bonita Springs needed this guidance to grow and prosper. You have done so much during your time leading the city. You were accredited in 2013 as one of the individuals instrumental in the Hertz Corporation's decision to move from New Jersey to Southwest Florida. In 2014, you were named Gulf Shore Business Magazine as one of the 36 people in Southwest Florida who quote unquote, who make things happen. These are both honors you earned and deserved and we are grateful to you that you have benefited from these tributes right along with you. Most recently, you were severely tested in the fall of 2017 when Hurricane Irma struck the Southwest coast of Florida and traveled up the entire peninsula. Bonita Springs was later determined by FEMA as the third hardest hit community in the state of Florida. You led our team through grueling times, often working long into the evening, day after day. Your sacrifice during this time will not be forgotten. You were acknowledged for your work by the Naples Daily News when they gave you kudos for, your, for the work you did. Specifically, the article mentioned Benita Springs City Manager Carl Schwing received loud applause as many stood an ovation during an Irma update at Wednesday City Council meeting, end quote. You have navigated the city through the good times and tough times, and we give you special thanks for your leadership, vision, and caring. We thank you for all that you have done and send our gratitude and best wishes for a happy retirement. Sincerely yours, Peter Simmons, Mayor, City of Bonita Springs. Carl. Thank you does not capsulate it, but thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Would you like to say yeah. So thank you all very much. Um, it has been an honor to be able to serve the residents of Bonita Springs for the last seven years. It's gone fast. Um, I could have only done what we did, what I did, because of the wonderful staff team we have here that we've been able to promote and hire and develop over time. And they remain, and um, I just wish the city well in the future, and yes, I look forward to retirement. It's time. <laughs> God bless you, Carl, and thank you very, very much. And Amy, I'd like to, if you have a few words for Carl. Well, Carl, I just want to uh, offer my uh, congratulations on your retirement and believe me there is life after retirement having been I'm now in my third career or at least my fourth career so um, and I wish you just joy and happiness and the, and the time to um, to really experience the kinds of things that you haven't had a chance to do it and I thank you so much for your kindness to me I'm relatively new on the council and you've been incredibly supportive and responsive to all my concerns so thank you for what you have done, and uh, I appreciate what you're going to do in the future. Carl, I've known you since you've been here. I knew you a little bit out in Cape Coral with our, my profession. Uh, you're a professional person. You're a great person. You do everything for the community. From When you moved here, you joined the Rotary. You help out in the community like there's nobody's business, and you want none of the accolades. When you, when we have festivals, you're always in the background. You're never up on stage. You're never asking for a pat on the back. You're, 
you're the guy in the background do, making everything happen here, and uh, you're going to be missed. And it, I do really appreciate all you've done for the city and for for me. Thank you very much. Carl, it's <laughs> been an honor working with you for <laughs> this very short time, but you've been very kind to me, and I do wish you the best of luck. And um, I also appreciated your sense of humor. <laughs> I guess we can use this, Carl. Um, you hit the nail on the head in terms of what you developed in terms of a great staff, and you always realized it wasn't about yourself, but it was about the whole team. And a lot of people in this town don't realize uh, that thanks to your leadership, we have such a dedicated, hardworking group of professionals here. Um, personally, I found you to be also one of the hardest working people I've ever seen. And that is immensely appreciated. So best of luck in your retirement. And I would echo what Amy said about retirement. It's actually a lot of fun. So, um, and you deserve it. So uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Congratulations on your retirement. Um, it's been great working with you these last four years. Um, you've been a great help. Um, and like it's been said, you, you did assemble a great staff, and, and I feel we are in good hands uh, with, with you retiring, and, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm living proof there is life after retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I've had about four or five careers and retired from each one. Um, you know, it's been great working with you, and it seems like it was just yesterday I got on city council, although that was a little more than two years ago, and I wish you the best in your retirement. And my prediction is you won't stay retired too long. That, that's inevitable, because if, if you don't, if you don't, if you just keep retired, then your mind will go, and you don't want to do that. Well, that's scary. That is scary. <laughs> it's a good thank reason you. to be active. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Any staff, anybody else with a, with a word to say? Anybody from the public? Yes, Chief. <laughs> wasn't going to but I must Carl thank you um, since I've been the chief um, I think our relationship has developed into a very professional and uh, as well as personal relationship um, you have my utmost respect as a new chief and guidance and I know I came to you with some uh, leadership issues and uh, management issues and you helped me personally get through them so I just wanted to personally thank you for those times it means a lot to me Anybody else? Um, sorry, excuse my voice, but on behalf of your team and your staff, you'll be greatly missed as a friend and as a mentor. So thank you. Thank you, Arlen. Hi, Carl. Hi, Carol. Um, you will be greatly missed, and I have never worked for an organization before. I've worked for a lot of corporations, and I've never had leadership like I did here with you. You've always had our back. And I have never worked with such a professional person as I have with you. And I think I speak, sorry, I'm so emotional, but I think I speak to everyone in our staff how much we're gonna miss you. And I wish that, um, first of all, that you will enjoy, but I have a feeling you won't be retired too much longer because you're just such a, outgoing and you just have so much energy and and you bring that to every staff meeting and every every obstacle that comes in your way you always look for the positive and you always we're going to get it done and and I've never seen anybody work so hard in to keep the staff involved and to keep the staff motivated and I'm just glad you had our back all these years, and I hope you know that we always had yours. So, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. God, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yes. Can I speak? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Whatever you're comfortable with. Carl, I'm going to miss you so much. Thank you for being um, one of my role models. Um, thank you for. Um, just introducing me to um, working with city government and um, your favorite millennials. Really going to miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ed, you're coming up. Hey, Ed. This hey, yeah, 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 Ed. Hey, Ed. I got to see if I can find something nice to say. Yeah. Hey, Ed, tread lightly, all right? <laughs> I do, I do want to thank um, Carl for his professional courtesy and friendship to me and everything that I've done over the years, sometimes in an adversarial position. But you have been a gentleman. You are a gentleman. I thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Hi, Kathy. Hi, everybody. <coughs> I just have to say a few words. I've known you since the very beginning. I was here when you were interviewed and everything, and you were almost a neighbor of mine and everything. And I just want to tell you that you are going to be missed. And you know, of course, I'm on, people know I'm on a number of committees here. I believe it was Laura that said, gee, I saw you here all the time. I thought you worked here. Well, <laughs> I've been happy to do all that I have. And listen, good luck, good health, and good times. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. John, hello again. Uh, hello, everyone. Carl, I just want to say it was an honor working with you over the past years. Um, I wish you all the good luck in the world. Thanks, John. Thank you. Anybody else? Carl, God bless you. Okay. Happy retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Thank you. All right. Mayor, can I make a quick point about the agenda? I'm wondering if we could move up the presentation of the uh, attorney group before uh, the D. So in other words, come after the other public, but before the city presentation. Council? Yeah. No, motion? Just as a courtesy. Not, not a heads, I mean? No, yeah. yeah. Okay. Courtesy to them. Fred, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. I was hoping you'd move up the fire thing. Okay. Because they're here, they, they need to go back to work. Yeah, he's got an 11 o'clock meeting. City's I knew, great do know that. Carol about the chief. We're going to do that. Okay, we'll, we'll do that we'll as well. After the attorney. Yeah. Carl, God bless and God speed. Thank you very, very much. Okay, we're going to move on to item A, a presentation um, by Margaret Wurzel, Executive Director of the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council on the progress of the affordable, attainable <laughs> housing study as well as potential grant for opportunities. And this is Green Sheet. 18050137. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Arlene Hunter, Assistant City Manager. For the record, uh, Margaret Wurzel with the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council is here to give you a midpoint update on the affordable housing study that was um, asked by City Council to provide information. As you recall, the mayor at the last meeting had received an email from Ms. Wurzel with an update of some potential fundings slash loan program. She's going to give a brief overview of that, but before we were to look into any further grant activities, we wanted to make sure that the council was aware of the direction the study was going and to get some feedback from you all to see what, what is the appropriate funding opportunities we would be looking at. Also in the interim between the last council meeting, um, Ms. Worsell had made us aware of some additional potential funding opportunities through the United States Department of Commerce. Uh, Economic Development Administration, and she's going to give a brief overview of those, which might complement some of the LMS programs that we're looking at. And this would just be a general discussion level at this point, and then we'd have to bring further action back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Arlene. Thank Margaret, you. good morning. Good morning. Um, I have some handouts for you. And I, and I do want to say that these are draft documents. Um, my direction was to um, speak to stakeholders throughout your community and identify what the needs are um, here in Bonita Springs. 
um, to gather, gather their comments, research best practices through, across the country uh, for supplying affordable, attainable housing and uh, give you a, a list of different tools that you could possibly um, use here in the city of Bonita Springs um, and some recommendations. Uh, if you look at the beginning of the document, there is a list of, of the stakeholders that I have, have met with. The comments um, are listed after that. Um, most people had wanted um, to be anonymous, so I didn't identify comments with any particular stakeholder. From what I have learned from, from speaking to these, these individuals is that there is a need for the full spectrum of affordable housing in Bonita Springs, from uh, homeless shelters to transitional housing, uh, senior housing, workforce housing, or attainable housing. Um, the, the next section that I have here is, it's called options. And what I've done is, is look, listed different ideas, different practices that are going on across the United States. And I've also given you the, the city that is using this. So if you wanna look further into this and how it, you know, the details of how it works, you can do that. And then I just broke it down under the next um, heading of toolbox with all the different options that you, you could look at um, and decide if they were good for Bonita Springs or not. There's about 43 different um, options there. I've started to look at our recommendations for the city. Um, the, the first recommendation I would have, and, and I'm certainly not done with this because I need feedback from you as well as different individuals now that I have something down on paper, um, is you need to focus on one section, one sector of this population. It's, it's just too huge to try to tackle all the affordable housing needs at once. And I believe the consensus is um, workforce housing. However you're going to define that, whether uh, it's 30% of income or whatever, but you need to define it and then focus on, on that. And the reason one of the um, issues I'm coming to you now with the recommendations is because there are some, there is uh, disaster supplemental money that is coming down that can help you jumpstart the program here. Uh, there has been some talk about a, a um, housing authority in talking to some of the stakeholders. I don't think you need to start a whole new housing authority over again. There are several um, nonprofits that are willing to step up and help with affordable housing in, in this area um, that, that could you know, save you from having to do that. Um, I, I have one more hand. Well, I have several more handouts. Do you want me to? Okay. Yeah, I'll get it for you. She has that over there. The last section of the report I gave you, though, was we started looking at what is available in Bonita Springs for affordable housing. And, and property seems to be one of the big issues when in talking to um, yes, developers or the Builders Association or any of the nonprofits. It's the land is so, so expensive. We took a quick look. This is not a deep dive into properties that, that should be targeted for acquisition or anything like that. This is just looking what's out there. Um, we, we would need to then go back and look at, are they in a floodplain? You know, what is the size of it? Does it work with the zoning regulations? There's a lot more that has to be done. But there is just a very quick look at properties that are for, currently for sale in this area that could potentially be used for affordable housing. I've handed out a, a sheet, a flyer on federal uh, appropriate appropriations that have been approved. And as you can see, the CDBG money is coming down. It's not available yet, but it should be available in the fall. And it definitely will allow for acquisition. It will allow for rehab. It will um, allow for elevation. And my recommendation is take advantage of this funding source. It's a huge pot of money that is coming to the state of Florida. Um, 
it can give you the op what you need to do though is identify the properties that need to be rehab that need to be elevated that need to be bought out you need to be prepared for when this um, is announced that you can apply for it that you know exactly how much money you need and where you're targeting um, and that was my major reason reason for giving you an update today is um, to have you start thinking about whether this is a pot of money the CDBG this HUD money is something that you want to apply for and if you want to go forward with identifying properties that that need to be a part of this having said that um, you'll also see on that flyer that there is um, I'm sorry to keep bothering you um, that there is the um, EDA the Federal Economic Development Administration uh, funding that is open right now there was about six hundred million dollars allocated um, <laughs> thank you a hundred and forty seven million will be coming to region four it sounds like a lot of money it is a lot of money but when you look at uh, region four it includes Alabama Georgia Kentucky uh, Mississippi North Carolina Florida Tennessee and South Car Carolina Margaret and I apologize what was that number I didn't um, the original allocation was six hundred thousand million six hundred million and it's a hundred forty seven three hundred sixty two million um, that is coming to region four thank you uh, this is a, a hmm, first come first serve there's no deadline when this has to be submitted but when the funding is done the funding is done and we have been working uh, we the regional planning councils across Florida have been working on identifying projects writing up the pre applications and actually uh, Southwest Florida has already submitted their final applications for a project um, so if you are interested in applying for this and and some of your flooding issues that have been addressed are um, could be you could use this pot of money to apply for it but you need to decide soon so that you actually um, can be considered for this now can I just interrupt for one second sure. I just for clarity is this the same money that uh, Shante had talked about uh, when we talked about our priorities? So the CDBG right. that Ms. Wurzels is already, we've already accounted for that and we prioritize our LMS program which is required to have those projects listed in there and that was specifically the IBE Downs right. um, Street, that corridor for both elevations, land acquisition, but then also looking at infrastructure improvements. Okay, so that's and they do qualify for the low to moderate income communities right. of the CDB pro and program. And that was part of that whole presentation. Correct, I mean, Margaret correct. was not here, obviously, right. but we've had that. Right. Okay. So you've prioritized those. The EDA money mm -hmm. is separate, and I think we would need to tie in how that complements the existing programs we have because it was a suggestion to look at Bull Logan Boulevard. We're still working that through the LMS process for the hazard mitigation funds as okay. well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, several months, not several months, about um, three months ago we had a request from EDA to submit projects they wanted two projects from every regional planning council we actually submitted about five and Benita Springs was on that list so you're on their radar for this this EDA money if you want to pursue the application <coughs> um, I, I gave you a sheet that outlines two projects and one is the um, the Logan Boulevard I had been talking um, with Phil Flood about that project and he had indicated that that if the canals are built along the Logan Bill, uh, Boulevard extension then it would help flooding in residential areas but also all of the commercial that is along um, Bonita Beach Road at the interchange of 75 um, and that is what this money is targeting targeting um, economic development so commercial properties uh, businesses and anything that was impacted by Hurricane Irma and you definitely have have meet that criteria for that the other uh, portion of that that I put on that little handout describing the projects is um, your culverts the the study that Jim Beaver did um, on what is needed in order to reduce the flooding and address some of your flooding issues that also that portion of his study will also um, meet the requirements of the CD, 
EDA funding if you want to do that. Um, it has a 20% uh, percent match, which for EDA is, is actually good because it's usually a one-to-one -one match. Um, so 20% is a, a significant reduction. And what you are doing with Logan Boulevard and that funding can be used as a match for the, for the other portion of it. They're, they've been very flexible with the supplemental funding. So I just wanted to present that information to you um, so that you can review it, get back to me, um, discuss it, and let me know what direction you want to go. And staff thinks it might be helpful to set a meeting with Shanti and Margaret mm -hmm. and coordinate the efforts we're doing together so that everything's complemented. Um, we will be continuing the LMS process for a tier one project for two for two million three hundred fifty thousand. Um, in talking with Ms. Wurzel last week, she mentioned that Mr. Beaver believes there's more to fund Logan Boulevard, some improvements to culverts, different things we could be looking at. So we want the projects to complement each other. Um, and I think what we were looking for today at a very high level was some agreement that we wanted to combine those efforts together and see what makes sense. Thank you, Arlene. Council, any questions? Amy? Well, I think it makes sense to combine them so that we could have a strategic plan and we're not so shotgun about what we're applying for everything. Uh, I think that's a good thing. I just have one question. Um, should we apply for these things, as you suggested? Um, who, what is the hierarchy of the decision makers? Does the, R, uh, does the regional planning agency make a, a recommendation uh, on the priorities? Does Lee County control the funding, or how does that come, or do you make a direct appeal to uh, the EDA? Uh, we make a direct appeal to the EDA, and, and, and let me tell you why. We are a federal economic development district, mm -hmm. all of our southwest Florida mm -hmm. region. EDA requires us to have a, uh, a regional economic development plan, mm -hmm. um, and for that reason, they come to us to make sure that any project that is submitted mm -hmm. um, is consistent with that plan. Mm -hmm. Your projects are con mm -hmm. consistent with that. Um, they have been working directly with the regional planning councils on this particular pot of money mm -hmm. um, to flush out the projects, to get them in good shape, mm -hmm. to help us tweak them. Um, and, and so they're aware of every, every project that is coming in mm -hmm. um, because we've been, we have been working with them. So, so we rely upon you on getting us at a, at a reasonable <laughs> priority level. Yeah, we, yes, we have your foot in the door right, right now. Right, yeah, and, and so it's, it's you're basically <coughs> the, the gatekeeper. <laughs> Let me. Yeah, and, and if you decide to go forward, I mm -hmm. mean, it's up to you. If you decide to go forward, we will push for your project to be okay. funded. Okay, thank you. With the EDA, the outreach has been to the Regional Planning Council it's for all of the jurisdictions in Southwest mm -hmm. Florida has not been through Lee County. And based on the summary sheet you see, this was based on existing studies that the Regional Planning Council had to move forward in their overall project for Southwest Florida. Okay, thank you. Fred, you had a comment? Yeah, <clears throat> two comments. <clears throat> One of them was that uh, in the event that we needed some additional assistance besides our local uh, organizations that Margaret has said we should try and work with on affordable housing, uh, which was, I think, Love Inc. and uh, what's uh, Benita? I always get hung up Benita on. Assistant yeah, no, no, no. Benita. There's a foundation. Benita. Yeah, that that, that the, the Queblo Benita, whatever. What's Pueblo, that that also. Yeah, that one, and then Habitat. <clears throat> I suggested instead of anybody proposing to set up a housing authority, just farm that little bit of extra work out to RPC because you get away from the local politics and you're gonna, it's, it's gonna cost a ton of money for a housing authority, a couple hundred thousand a year, staffing and overhead and all that. Uh, the other thing is that I think uh, I'd asked Margaret, we were talking, I rode up to uh, the uh, Sterile Bay Management meeting with her on uh, Monday and, and we were talking about some of these grants and I said, well, you, can you help us write? And she said, oh yeah, we'll write it, but if we write it up, 
then they will put in that they'll be the, what do you call it, the project administrator? That, that was my next, uh, yes. The, yeah. So what Margaret has discussed with, the, with staff is that they would not charge a fee to prepare any of the grant applications, but if the community, if the city is awarded the grant, they would request an uh, interlocal agreement to be the contract administrator of that grant for the EDA process yeah. is mm -hmm. what we've which, discussed. Which I would like to add my comment. I think that's a more <coughs> than fair deal because they're going to do the work to get the grant and they know how to administer and that solves another problem because we're not, we're trying to be government light and all that. So. That, that would be separate from the LMS process. We do ha currently have a contract with um, Aptum to work through that process right. and that contract is just for the <coughs> Um, writing and preparing of those grants. We will be doing another request for proposals after that to meet the FEMA regulations for the grant, for the grant should they be awarded for a contract administrator. Okay. And, and I just want to say that that is typical of the way we operate. Um, communities come to us and, and oftentimes they, they cannot afford uh, to pay for grant writing services. So what we do is write the grant for them. And if there's administrative fees, we write ourselves in there to administer the grant. Um, that way, if they get the grant, we will be reimbursed for our work. If they don't, there's no lo loss to them. Um, we, we have, there are, have been some communities that have said, we just want you to write the grant, we'll take care of everything else, and then we charge a, a fee for writing the grant. So but the first, stop is, the first stop is coordination with Shante to figure out what grants we may be applying for before we get into. And that would be, to, then that would come back for council's approval with the understanding of what the match requirement is at 20% and what, what, what we can do to global match, which is what Shante alluded to before is right. cross matching programs. So we'd want a whole uh, list of everything we're applying for, for each particular organization and how those matches coordinate each other so that we're not overextending ourselves as well. Council sound good? That's good. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. And then as the affordable housing project comes back for final review, we would then look at any other grant opportunities for affordable housing land acquisition or other items as well. We just wanted to get direction from council on that because Margaret did pass that opportunity forward, but we wanted to see um, how council's direction was on that as well. Yep. No, that sounds good. Well, Greg? I, I think we need to have a discussion right. about where we want to go with this uh, from a policy and concept point of view, like picking out which one of those 12 things you have on the list. Why don't we add it to that we workshop would, we have in we, motion? We can start the conversation then, uh, but we would need some interaction with Margaret at some point. But I think we could outline what we need to accomplish, you know, like decide which ones we're going to focus on. What What is our, we could just talk about it from a strategy point of view. but. For me, it's way too early to make a decision because I don't have enough information. I have to read, first of all, read yes, all this, this stuff a lot of and have some dialogue with you. That's the way I feel. I don't know. Maybe other people can have that. <coughs> but I would like to have a more robust conversation about it. And I thank you for the effort that you made. It, it looks, I'm really interested in what you've done here, so I can't wait to read it. Greg and then Peter. Well, I just, I guess I missed something in the translation that we started out on affordable housing and then we ended up on flood mitigation. I, I missed the the, uh, the the comma or whatever. <laughs> How are these two tied? I mean, I know that Margaret, Margaret was assigned to do the affordable housing, figure out which kind of affordable housing we want and where we're going to do it. And then Jim Beaver is our whole flood mitigation. And now it seems like they're both intertwined. Am I missing something? Or? So, so the first part of the presentation was the affordable housing. In the interim, in essence of time, Margaret wanted to provide the opportunity for the EDA money, which is flood mitigation, which is a separate topic okay. as well. Greg, there was a musical interlude in the middle. You I, missed. I guess I, I must have blacked out and didn't have enough coffee or something. <laughs> I, I missed the whole. You didn't read your green sheet. It's I read the green sheet. It was sheet. a great halftime show, it buddy. Said, well, well said, I read the green sheet. I just got up from your nap. It said yeah. we were talking about three different things. Well, I understand that, but. You should number them. Yeah. I, I apologize. It's, they they it's, are yeah. not no, no. intertwined, the two projects. Well, and that's why, I mean, I thought we were talking about affordable housing. Yeah, I knew we were right. going to the other ones, but then it was like, which one do you want to do? You want to do, you know, uh, workforce housing, X, Y, and Z, and then. I missed a boop or to turn the page or we went into something else. So I was making sure I was, wasn't having a stroke up here. No, no, you're good. Yeah, you're good. You're good, buddy. You're good. Pete? Look, um, just actually to Greg's point and Amy's, um, there was a really good, uh, I guess it was a commentary in the Naples paper about a month ago by this fellow, Brett Batten, and it was, well, what is affordable housing? And I think that goes to the point of the policy discussion we have to have. And you alluded to it in terms of the 30% of income and stuff. Um, we really have to define 
what we mean. We have to define the problem. And then I haven't read it because you just handed it out, but I'm sure this is a great aid toward understanding that. So we need to, as Amy said, we need to come back and figure out what we think the issue is, how we define it, and what the actions we can practically take to do that. One quick question. Does Lee County have a, an affordable housing program? I know they have an affordable housing coalition. Co I mean the county now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what their program is. Okay. I know um, if you want to look at a, a good model locally, Sanibel has an excellent model. Okay. They recently did a presentation to our board. You know, at first I was pretty skeptical, but after I've seen the presentation and asked questions, it, it's pretty remarkable, and, and you might want to invite them to do one for you. Well, that's good advice. And that's Thank you. That's the land trust, correct? Yes, yes. Thanks for your work, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Fred, w one last thing. Um, on the Sanibel model, the one thing they have I know some of us are interested in, and that is they've created a foundation. So the, the home that's built, the people never get to sell it. So you lose that affordable housing because they sold it at the market price. The other thing is that she did ask staff to look at, and I think this is, even though we haven't had our dialogue, I think that we, that we need to understand it. She wanted them to identify some sites that would be good areas of where you could buy a single family home site that's vacant, one that's kind of in bad, bad repair, that needs to be bulldozed, one that's possibly doesn't have to be bulldozed but needs a lot of work so that this would be the target of one of these grants that they might write up. Okay. So I think we <coughs> want to factor that into our discussion on what the 20 next week. Quickly. Okay. Uh, Amy? I just want to mention Last one. call. No, I, I forgot to say it under my uh, time is that I am attending the Horizon Council general meeting I forgot where it is. <laughs> it's, I think it's at the uh, FSW or something, but I do have your thing. And their topic is uh, attainable housing. That's what their topic is on this Friday. Um, I think we have two, two free tickets there. I'm going. I don't know if anyone else wants to go, but uh, I will report back what comes out of that. It's supposed to be a fairly uh, substantive thing. I don't know if uh, Margaret is, is intending to going on that. Um, but if anybody wants information, I'll let you know because I can't recall where it, where it is. But it's eight. I think it's eight o'clock on Friday. Oh, in Fort MPO. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Great. you got to get up early. And Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got a frog in my throat. We're now going to move on to item B, a presentation uh, by Dr. Sandra, with the Institute of Entrepre Entrepreneurship. Excuse me, of Florida Gulf Coast University. Good morning. How are you? Fine. I think we lost nice to see clicker. you again. Good. I think I lost the clicker. I know. It's oh. right here. Oh, good. You, good you to see you. You didn't lose it at all, yeah, and no, hopefully no. that one's working better than mine. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Um, uh, Dr. Sandra Kawanui. It's That's a hard one to say. Most of the kids call me Dr. K, so that works. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to do a real quick overview of what our institute and um, what we're doing at, the, at FGCU and the entrepreneurship program, which is growing dramatically and I think will help with economic development in, in our community over the short period of time. Um, the institute's, our mission is to actually help FGCU students, inspire them to, to realize that they can make what they believe and what they want to do possible and real. Um, we, we put together a nucleus of faculty and staff to do this with, as well as we have a number of experienced mentors that uh, have, have failed at retirement and want to have something to do. So uh, they, they've been very supportive of what we're doing. Uh, we've, uh, our vision is to really be the catalyst for change for uh, emerging entrepreneurship ecosystem in Southwest Florida. So we're, we've, we've got a big goal in, in mind. Uh, for that, we, we have begun to uh, support and teach our students how to start businesses, um, but not only just to start their own companies and grow their own companies, we're looking at scalable businesses. So we're, we're not as 
you know, we've, we've been working with, instead of um, more the, what the SBDC does, which is to sp start small businesses and grow them, we're looking at businesses we can scale. Um, but also to help, help change and invigorate the local economy and add values to our employers. We believe that what we're doing with our entrepreneurship education is actually helping to make students more viable and, and add value to them as they go into the workplace. So many of them will work. I think the average is 7.2 years before they start a business, although we've got a group over here that, are, that actually has started and growing their business that I'll introduce you to. Um, the whole idea around entrepreneurship is basically problem, teaching them to problem solve. It's, it's identifying problems and seeing them as opportunities, not as problems, and learning to validate their assumptions so they don't go out and start something that nobody really wants, uh, to create uh, businesses and ideas and products that, that people um, need and want. Uh, also, to, to work together in, and implement a team collaborative environment, and and all of our all of our courses and everything we do is based on experiential e uh, education. What we have found is is that teaching them to memorize text doesn't work, but teaching them to do and actually project based learning is made a big difference. So, what we have done, which is very unique. To, to FGCU, there are only three in the country like it. So this is what's the big deal, is that we are not a college of business program. We are a university degree. And what that means is that within our entrepreneurship core, we, um, students are taking basically courses in all the other fields. So even as a degree program, they can take health, arts, education, science, engineering. So what we get is engineering, biology students to come in with ideas and, and uh, products that they've developed and now want to figure out how they can take it to market which is very different than what I used to do with College of Business students where everybody was great at figuring out the business issue, but the idea of innovation and create creativity wasn't so hot. Um, what that has done is there are only three of these in the country right now, uh, and I'll tell you where they are. One's in Florida State, that they have an interdisciplinary entrepreneurship program, and, and then um, the other is, is Close School of Business, uh, Close School of Entrepreneurship, which is in uh, Drexel. And, and they are the only three of its existence right now. So we opened ours at the end of September. Uh, and of course, that was in the midst of all the hurricane. And uh, I really had no idea it would grow at the level it did. We have now got 200 students in the degree program after about five or five or six months. Um, the, the minor is the largest at the university. And we are the largest now in the country. So we are larger than Florida State, which is capped it at 80, and uh, which got $100 million to do it. So uh, then uh, we also are larger than the closed school who's been around for three years. So I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish with this interdisciplinary entrepreneurship. And our board of trustees, our new president, which I'm sure you've met, and, and provost have been wonderful. They made entrepreneurship a pillar of the university. So it is now, funding has been directed in that, in that area, and we are really having the opportunity to impact change. What we tell our kids is we don't want them to leave Southwest Florida. We want to keep them here and start their businesses here. The idea being that we have got some other programs that we continue to support them even after they graduate. So I'll tell you about those. Um, I'm going to skip through the videos, or we'd be here all day. Um, the, that was the halftime show coming. That up, was right? a halftime. Yeah. Hear it? All right. I would do Sorry. them. <laughs> They're great because they taught the kids. Actually, tell you why they did what they did. But we have a time constraint. So, so the minor we again I've said is we've got minors from all over the university. That's another great 
uh, video. Uh, but the other thing is, it's not just, like I say, starting businesses. What we're doing is <clears throat> Gardner, Hertz, Arthrex, the, all the big companies are telling us that they would hire our kids over any of the others. And I actually got in an elevator with the Gardner the other day, the three guys from Gardner, and they somebody went to introduce me and they said, oh no, we know who she is. We hire her students. And the reason for it is because they're creative and innovative. So. Um, they, they learn how to take limited resources and, and find ways to make that work, and they can communicate a vision and turn ideas into action. So uh, the, the startups, we've had a number of startups. Uh, I actually have brought one of our startups with us today, uh, but we have created a number of startups. They, uh, they, they, they really, um, uh, we've got 22, as a matter of fact, that have started and operating right now. Uh, after this semester, we'll probably have more. Um, a lot of them have created intellectual property. Uh, they're beginning to start to hire people, and they, they're raising money. Now, this is one of the good deals with this. Uh, I've been very lucky in the last uh, two years to raise some funds. Actually, it's going to go over 250 as of this spring, um, where I have raised money through donations, grants, and various different things. Because the biggest problem our kids have is that, you know, it may only be $25,000 or $10,000 or $5,000, but they need some seed funding to get started, build prototypes, develop their products or businesses. So we have awarded $250,000 in the last two years to our Eagle entrepreneurs, and um, they have been they, they sign a document now. When we first started, we didn't have them sign it, but now they sign it that it has to be used for the business. It can't be used for salary. And if they, if they decide not to do the business, that it will be returned. So it's not an award and a gift. It is, uh, they, have a, they have a responsibility. If, they, you know, if it doesn't work, that's, that's a different story, but we want them to do it. I will say, though, that we've had two students who, before any signed contracts were done, we've taught, I guess we've done a pretty good job with their ethics because they both gave it back. And, and redonated it back to the foundation for other students because they said they had changed their mind and life had had certain circumstances, so they gave it back. But we have done that, and uh, uh, we also, as you notice, that right now we're at the Emerging Technology Center in off of Alico Road, and we have an incubator there. That runway program has been a major thing for us. Uh, we, we received uh, the first year a quarter of a million dollars grant from, this is in addition to our seed funding, we received a quarter of a million dollars through the Naples Accelerator as part of their funding. We started our incubator. We have 3D printers. We have all sorts of software in there. We have uh, uh, other equipment for the students. And through that, that, that started last fall. They could apply to be in this incubator, and they did not have to take a class. So beyond going for taking a course or doing anything else, what I have found is students work very, very hard when they want to do something. And so we took in the fall, we just started it. We took 20-some kids in. By spring, we had 40-some. Last fall, I had 80-some. And then in the spring, I think we were up to 100. So. These are kids that are coming in, spending 80 hours of their time, developing a plan to start a business, and then pitch for seed funding. So that's the extent that this has been growing. This is in addition to all the, the students that we have in the degree program. So the runway program will continue, and, and, and it is something that we believe. We, we have started taking alumni. If somebody, because the alumni are coming back now and saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I got a degree from this school, but they didn't have this around when I was there. So we started taking alumni in, and uh, the alumni can come in and work. What I've found is some of our alumni are partnering with some of our students, and it's created a win-win because our alumni have got a little seed funding or little reserves because they've been out in the workforce for a while. So we're doing that as well. Um, again, we're going to skip through that. The other thing we're doing is for our veterans. We have a veterans entrepreneurship program which started um, 
we are we are completing our third year with and and I might come back to you at some point as we get closer to the fall uh, sign up to uh, and see if you can help in some way to just get the word out but our veterans entrepreneurship program is a tuition fee on a uh, program which we do a little bit online but it's mainly on campus and they come out to the incubator we do a full entrepreneurship um, program with them we help them start businesses and uh, to date, uh, we've we have uh, we have somewhere around, I think over 20 of, of our veterans who've started businesses. I know we have a very successful one in Benita right now, um, but we've we've um, the the veterans have overall. I think their revenue they've generated is $3.6 million that they've generated in revenue from their businesses. One of our veterans uh, was, was given an award at, um, by the governor for veterans entrepreneurship at um, a ceremony they did this last fall. And um, uh, he, he was in our first class. So it's been, it's been really rewarding. Um, a lot of these veterans come back, they don't know what they wanna do. They've lost their purpose. They've lost their direction. Many of them have had problems, and and they just they you know going from that to selling pizzas, <coughs> going from protecting our country to selling pizzas is a pretty tough road to hoe. So having a place they can go and help them to start a business is really good. We have gotten donations for that as well for seed funding. So we just recently gave out eighty five thousand dollars at our at, at our graduation. Uh, the funding to do this comes out of Veterans Florida out of the state. We did put together the curriculum and we have developed all the curriculum for the Entrepreneurship Veterans Program and it is now all over the state. So there are six other universities teaching the vet our FGCU's curriculum in, in entrepreneurship. So that's one of our veterans. He's he just got he just got twenty thousand dollars, so he's a happy camper. Um, we also are starting in the fall of this year a living learning community. It's an entrepreneurship living learning community, which I believe may end up being one of the one of the things that really, again, we as as a university may grow this and develop this into something even larger. But it is a place where students, freshmen, who can come, live, learn play and develop entrepreneurial ideas so they'll all live on campus we're going to put an incubator there and we're going to make that available for them there so uh faculty fellows we have faculty we're teaching we're helping faculty from every field including biology science engineering how do you integrate entrepreneurship in their classroom this is not about a single course or a single degree this is about changing a university to so the university and the faculty think more entrepreneurially. Uh, community outreach, the high schools, we've, we've got a high school competition that we do each year, that, that we started this past year. We had a, that picture down there is all the high school kids from across Lee and Collier. We had, uh, I've been working with the, the Benita uh, Springs High School to de develop an interdisciplinary high school entrepreneurship program because he, he We've been talking about that. I've been on that advisory board. Um, we also have a week-long high school CEO academy through Junior Achievement with our with our kids that starts in June, June fifth. So our competitions. Uh, this is my last, and you know, probably my uh, the the thing that I'm most proud of. And it's not me; it's our kids. Um, we have we have been we have now been sending students to state and, and uh, all over the United States for competitions. Uh, for the Schultz Foundation, which is out of uh, Minnesota, St. Paul, uh, we got, there were 150 students, 200 students, uh, teams applied with over 100 universities around the United States, and we were chosen as one of 25 to go for, for competition. They did re re uh, receive funding. The other is the venture pitch. We were, we were at uh, three of the four people that went to that venture pitch at Babcock Ranch were our kids. Uh, ended up to be our students or our graduates. Um, 
the U.S. Dabbler, uh, which is out of USF, we, uh, we had several of our students become uh, Dabbler faculty fellows. And the biggest and best of all of this is we took the cup away from UF this uh, spring with the Governor's Cup at our competition at Florida State, and the kids are here from that. Uh, you all want to stand? Yeah. So. With their room dig, so so I have to tell you that it was an exciting event to uh, to stand up there and and you know with some of the top schools in the state of uh, Florida that we competed against and had uh, FGCU's team win and uh, I sent a picture to our president from the president of uh, FS uh, Florida State who just uh, was there with us with that so it was a really great <laughs> event. Uh, we have speakers all over the place, and we, uh, from from all of our key business owners and and CEOs that we do, uh, we had a large expo uh, this year. We had the entire Cohen Center filled, full of entrepreneurship students and veterans. So that's this is our institute, and that's what we're doing, and we're going to help to change the economic development of uh, of uh, this community and help do that. And we can use any mentors or any volunteers that you might have in the community who would like to work with us on it. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I, for one, would like to stay involved. We met a few weeks yes. back. I thought highly. A lot of the students were there. The young entrepreneurs at the uh, Benita Springs Estero uh, uh, Economic Development Council mm -hmm. Chamber event yes. um, and would like to be involved, stay involved, would like to organize with the new high school, as you know, in Benita Springs yes. that's opening up this fall. So yeah. if and, you and, and I can follow up however we need to do that, I'd like to personally step forward and be involved. Yes, and I want to let you know that I have actually, we train the Collier County high school teachers. Uh, I'm getting ready to do the junior high school teachers in Collier. Uh, the, uh, this summer, but but we would certainly like to work with the with the high school teachers yes. to help them. We need to bring entrepreneurship all the way through our school system because when we do that, we create problem solvers, opportunity rec people who can recognize opportunities and make a difference in this world. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I might go off the wall here if it's okay, because I know we have some people pressing up against deadlines. Could we move your agenda up now, Pete, and then have the chief on deck? Would that be okay? Are we talking about uh, the uh, city attorney? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. I, 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 I know people are on some deadlines here, so if we could do that, I'd, is that council any objections there? Okay. It's actually Meg. Meg. Yeah. Sorry, Meg. It's okay. Um, I, um, on April 18th, you guys selected the committee for the Legal Services Advisory Selection Committee. Um, I have now been designated as the project coordinator if this project moves forward. You also directed the committee to draft a proposal for the um, outsourcing of legal services. Um, so at this point, I'm actually going to turn it over to the committee. I'm going to have the three of them introduce themselves and then go over the draft proposal that they have created. Great. Thank you, Meg. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi, uh, Pat Cauley. Uh, also have Larry Kurlander and Bernie Long here as well. So on April 18th, you appointed a committee. Uh, since that time, well, and we talked that at that time about the benefits we thought to the city of uh, outsourcing the legal fun function, which we won't go into now. So since we met uh, on the 18th, our committee has met. We've drafted an RFLIQ to send out to firms that would be interested. We met with uh, Meg and Audrey, and we also had um, Brenda look at the document we came up with to make sure that it complied with all the city policies and procedures and with Florida law. So assuming you give us the go ahead, we'll go ahead and get that released. And again, we would lean on the city to get their help from city staff to make sure it gets publicized appropriately so we get a robust response to that um, and then again assuming those come back uh, there'd essentially be two phases that we're looking at the first phase would be to find out which firms are interested and, f and then do our due diligence to check the backgrounds of those firms 
And that, of course, is the most important thing because we want to present to you a top quality firm. And then the second phase of what we're looking at would be to invite the firms in, interview them, bring them up to speed on exactly what's required of them. Uh, because really, when you look at it, there's essentially three buckets. There's attending all the city meetings that they need to attend and preparing for them. That's pretty easy to understand what kind of commitment that is. On the other end of the spectrum is litigation, which is very difficult to understand what you're getting into. So it's a little harder to control those costs, but that's no matter what form you have. And then the third thing is kind of all the day-to-day -day work, and that's where we really want to educate the firms, make sure they really understand what's being asked of them, because only then do we think we can get the best quotes from them. So, and that score will need more help from the city staff who have been very helpful so far so that the firms can really understand what's being asked of them. So if you have any questions on the document or uh, what we're doing, please go ahead. Council, Amy. I just had one question, and that's just the timing. Yes. I mean, it, it seems like we have to get the proposals in by the 8th. Is that enough time to get a response? Or uh, I think so, because that gives, I think, a little over three weeks. I mean, uh, is that a normal response time? Okay. And I, I think if it's well publicized, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it will be, you know, firms are used to doing this. Oh, and okay. so I think we'll get a, I don't think that's timing is an issue. Okay, thanks. Okay. Fred? Yeah, <clears throat> two questions. Um, I heard you say litigation. The consensus of the council, I thought, was that we were not going to replace the litigation council, the big one that we got. That, that's correct. This, and is sorry, little, this is little stuff. This would be, yeah, we're not looking to change any of those relationships. Okay. It would be new stuff, more day-to-day -day stuff. All right. Uh, then the other question I have is, <clears throat> I know when Councilman O'Flynn presented this, he kept saying cost effective, cost effective. <laughs> what have we got in, I know what I think cost effective is. You take the current cost of our in-house attorney, her staff, all their benefits and all that, that's one number, then she spends a, a certain amount routinely every year on these little litigation things that come in and out, eminent domain and all that, you put that together, that's the number that we're saying we're gonna be cost effective on. And if I know if we, get, if we do this and we run way over that, I don't know about the rest of council, but we don't have the money, I don't think, to do it. But we won't know till we do it for a period of time, but if it would run over that, that's where, that's where I'm gonna be. I think the committee is with you 100 percent. The okay. whole, the the two key points that we're after is quality yep. and responsiveness from a bigger firm, and uh, cost reductions. I, if we can't do that, then then we failed. That's well, the whole point. E even if it's more efficient and and we get uh, quicker turn or anything, as long as we don't exceed what we're already spending. I can live with that, but as soon as we go over that. I, yeah, and I the, the only thing that's difficult there is <coughs> the one bucket that's hard to control is litigation. And, you know, the litigation costs in the future are going to depend whatever <coughs> litigation the city gets into. So <coughs> the way we look at that type of work is the best I think you can really do to control that is to focus on the rates of those firms and what's required in that litigation. But I think if you look at a budget today versus five years from now and look at the litigation piece, yeah. those are going to be different because what the city is dealing with at the time is going to be different. Pro probably if you just take their cost of everything, the big bugaboo on this is going to be the stuff that they do that's called, well, I can't answer that question without research and the you prepare a memo and all that for council. And I know we get a lot of those out of Audrey as it is. So that, that's, to me, that work plus the routine stuff of coming to meetings, accepting phone calls and answering questions on the phone 
That's I don't don't have a problem with it. As long as we don't bust that on those two buckets of your three bucket deal. You know. Great, thanks. Council? Pete? No, I just want to thank uh, Pat, Larry, and Bernie for volunteering to do this. I mean, through the years we've always said, when are we going to get people who are retired, who've had a lot of experience, more involved in city matters, and uh, here we go. This is a great example, so at least from me, big thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Th Council, there are other questions or comments? Yeah, Craig, I, I got a couple questions <coughs> and comments. And, and I kind of piggybacking on what Fred says. And, and I do uh, commend you three for volunteering your time and your expertise. I still have, and I've said it before, I still have reservations about a big law firm coming in here. Because I know uh, at any given time we can pick up the phone and call Audrey. We get the same person every time, either Audrey or Carly. I've dealt with big law firms before, and uh, I deal with them now in my profession. They're not always available. That same person is not always available. Yeah, you can be assigned, and I'll use his name since we know him so well, as Don Thompson at Henderson Franklin. Don Thompson may not be there, or you know, even a, a John Spears or a, a Terry Lewis, and I know in, in, our, mm -hmm. in my business that you don't always get that same person. At least with an in-house attorney, you get that same person. And like Councilman Forbes said, you know, the re routine ham and egg stuff, whether <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, ordinances or whatever. Audrey can do those things. Can a larger company do it cheaper? Don't know. Don't think so because they've got more overhead than that. I mean, Audrey operates her staff at a, um, she's got one or two secretaries, legal aid, whatever. Uh, whereas, you know, a Henderson or Franklin or a Lewis Longley and Walker or whoever, they've got other people to worry about also. So their uh, fees are going to be, in my opinion, more. I'm not opposed to looking at it, but I just want us to go in this looking at it, eyes wide open, and I know that everyone on this council has at least called Audrey at least a few times a week, especially on issues coming up. And I think that when you start getting, and I know at one point for outside council with Theoretic in Spain, I won't use, we were sort of put on a gag order because all seven of us called up there and the bill was going up. Now that's uh, based on incorrect information. What you're saying is correct, but uh, you're, it was based on incorrect mm -hmm. information about that. But we, but we were still, at that time, we no, were supposed no. to go through a gatekeeper. Right, because incorrect information was okay. given to the city council, not by you. Not by me, I'm just right. saying. And not by Audrey. I'm just saying, at any given time, we all want to talk to Audrey. Right. And let's, let's fast forward a little bit to the event that's getting ready to come on after this with the Cheeky Hut. <laughs> I know Audrey spent a lot of Cheeky time. Cheeky or tiki? <laughs> oh, just all right. You say tiki tacky? No. She yeah. tiki hut. Pat. My point being is that I know Audrey spent all day one day and talking to the ethics board on that, similar to what Councilman Forbes said. You know, an outside firm's going to charge. Got to call the got to call the ethics. Going to have to involve X, Y, and Z on that. I'm just worried about the fiscal responsibility. If I might say, Greg, yeah. uh, I because I wouldn't. Pat's, I think, already said it twice. That, uh, the point you're making is exactly what is planned to be tested in this exercise. And I and, understand and, that. And, and, and there are plenty of cities that, when tested, have come in uh, on a much more cost-efficient basis. And, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I've got a call out right now to the League of Cities about that. Because the other thing is, is that when we talk about other cities, that we're, I want to see the cities with greater than 50,000 people. I know like, you know, a, a live oak in the panhandle outsources. They can't afford it. They got 10,000 people in their town. Of like and kind, I want, that's what I'm uh, tasked in the League of Cities yeah, right but, now, but, of but, like and kind. But, but, but the litigation doesn't come from the number of people. Raptor Bay would exist if we I'm had. I'm talking litigation. I'm no, talking well, in-house. No, that's where the expense goes. I'm talking in-house. Yeah. We're going to have the litigation, as Councilman Forbes right. said. We're not going to get rid of uh, well, Theory Act in Spain. Uh, to bring in a, a, a bigger company. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm uh, talking about the, the regular mm. every day that we go to Audrey mm. for or Clara for, or I mean, sorry, Car Carly for. That's what I'm talking about. I'm interrupting, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I'm just, yeah. I'm just expressing, I wanna go into this open-minded. And the other part of it is, you know, with the timeline, I know it's an accelerated timeline and I very much appreciate it. But if that timeline comes, and we find that it is not right, do we have time to hire a replacement for Audrey? And that's I what this exercise is yeah. all about. Yes, please, Can Pat, I address, go ahead. Try to, try to address everything. If I miss something, let me know. Your first point was on responsiveness. 
And the most important thing we have to do is due diligence on the firms that respond. And a key focus is going to be how responsive are you. And if they're not responsive, we're not going to present them to you. The second thing on cost uh, and availability, uh, yes, one of the benefits, we believe, of, of a bigger law firm is you're going to have somebody who's done this a lot. And so we think that will drive down costs. The other thing of a big firm is you have other specialties that you have at your fingertips if you need it. Uh, in terms of uh, timeline and having enough time to go a different route, we expect to get responses June 8th. So I think we're going to have a really good idea then, and we'll report back to you. Mm -hmm. You know, if we get a robust response, we'll be ve uh, very optimistic uh, that, that we can deliver a good product to you. All right, just if I may real quick just to respond to your response I guess a little bit we're not looking for those specialties we're not getting rid of a theory in Spain or something like that so we won't be looking for those if, as far as what Councilman Forbes has said and I think we've all agreed <coughs> we're not looking for those nuances but there are other you know you you have a labor issue you've got other people that do that okay. I mean there's plenty of other examples <laughs> I but understand. Uh, yeah, did, Fred, I, did I catch everything or okay Fred, you had something? Well, no, I was going to I was going to ask if this has been done and if it hasn't, I think it should be given to these firms. Audrey, do you can have you given them how many memos, opinions and all that that you issued last year? I gave Mr. Colley access to what I call my letter book, which has every written correspondence, formal correspondence, doesn't have emails, but it has the formal correspondence um, and Mr. Colley uh, can obtain copies of each month I've had it since 2001 so so they'll get that to get some idea on volume of memos because that's when the dollar meter runs because that's on the clock so to speak right and one of the things that we've asked Audrey for and she's been very helpful in the process so far is again to get good responses from firms they need to understand what they're getting into and so mm. we've asked her to drill down and tell us on a monthly basis how many hours do you spend doing this or this or this so that we can go back to the Good. firms and say, look, yeah. this is what you're getting into. Now, one now, well, let me make that very clear. I'm not going back and doing a self audit of where. No, I, I, sure I don't need you to say it's well, 22.4 hours. I just didn't need you to say you spend 20 to 25 hours right. on this or that. I think that. there's a little confusion, certainly on my part, because I, I don't know if we need to reconvene the committee on some of that. We can get some of those answers if it's needed, but it doesn't sound. If Again, counsel, let me. I have provided access to all of my information so it could be forensically determined if someone needs it. I have tried to give answers to the committee on some of this. On, what, on a given day, it's very difficult to try to give a monthly because, for example, um, Mayor Simmons, you're familiar with two issues that arose on Monday that I had to spend extensive time to get mm -hmm. the answers for the resident um, I don't want to really talk about the issues um, that I had to do but it, it required <laughs> phone calls it required of cracking open the books and everything else I might go a month or two without having right. that type of subject or it might resurrect itself after a month or two right so um, it's very difficult to ascertain on a daily basis what I can tell you and what I've told to prior council members that when going through this there's times where 90 percent of my job are is preventative and if i'm lucky it's preventative and i'm able beforehand to find out a staff member might be wanting to do something one way and because i'm able to talk to them bef beforehand we're able to catch something before it becomes an issue and that's right. the benefit of in-house <coughs> you can look towards outside um, that's pretty much the predominant benefit in-house when you look at the prices, and Councilman Forbes asked me yesterday to provide him with the hard costs, and I took it from our budget. We, you receive monthly the budget numbers. Um, we calculated it out that per, as a monthly to run the entire office, which would be me, um, an assistant city attorney, and my administrative staff, who basically has to do everything on the planet, so God bless her, including all fringe benefits and everything else, that's about 31000 a month. And if you're just looking at me with all benefits, 
it comes to 17.5 a month approximately. So I think we worked it out. We were doing the numbers approximately $100 an hour. Okay. So this Could you f send that to the committee as well, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yeah, well, if any member of council is in the middle, of, excuse me, if any member of council is getting in the middle of this exercise, mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to somehow route that information to the fellows I'll who are doing the work. I'll send that to council right now. Okay. Fred, you had a question? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I want to make sure that your RFP or whatever you call it has got in there that any time that, like right now, if I would call Audrey or the mayor or O'Flynn or Amy or any of us and it results in a memo, we all get it and that I would assume that same thing would be built into the contract. It's, it's important we all know what, what's going on, so to speak. Now, I, I'm not saying if I call and ask a question, that's a very simple answer. I don't see that's necessary to report it, in a, but I think we need to know what's going on a little, a little bit. I agree with you 100%. Good. We can make that crystal clear. Good. Crystal clear. <laughs> crystal. crystal. Council, any more questions or comments, thoughts, ideas? O only, Peter? only that uh, I think it's best that we not be involved in this process at all. Um, th this is a selection committee. They're going to make an advisory opinion to city council. And I personally think uh, the city council members should refrain from getting involved in this process, other than as it comes to us as agreed through the RFP. So we're hearing about it, learning about it, seeing, interacting with it, kind of in real time at the same time, if right. you will. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just like any other RFP. Sure, sure, uh, absolutely. So you mean the, uh, like the last day for the addenda questions? If, if we have things that we wanted to add to this, it's part of this, the schedule. Is that for us to have a little more input, what's, what's being put no, on no, this? No, no, I'm just saying we're not contacting the Meg. Um, we're, we're, Meg, maybe you can, or some staff can get a shot at protocol and RFPs. Not, well, I remember. think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would think what Councilmember O'Flynn is trying to say is if there are any questions involving this process, this procedure, that um, Council isn't going directly to Audrey, isn't going directly to the committee member, that's what I have been designated now for. So if there are any questions from Council regarding this process, if it can come through me, I can get the answers, I can disperse it to everybody appropriately. As for what Councilman Gibson was asking on the schedule, the last day for addenda questions, that's for the responding firms or any firms that are interested in the process. Um, yep. That's a normal process in the RFP, RFQ process. Um, that way, anybody that is wanting to respond, they send all the questions in, we as the city answer all the questions, post those all answers, right. so all potential applicants um, see all the same questions and answers. Um, comment. I, I have not talked to any firms about this, but this has not been a well-kept secret that there's a lot of interest that we're going this way, and I feel confident that some of us have already had conversations with some firms before the RFP is written, so I, I, I'm not proposing, I'm not going to talk to anybody, but I think it's important to know that some discussions have occurred. And to address that, um, it is once it's posted, which as of right now, we have a post date as of tomorrow. Right. Once it's posted, it says in the document that they are not to contact anybody but myself. Good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. So and it's- To yeah. also address a um, item that Councilman Forbes brought up earlier about some of the concerns and questions about what Audrey's day-to-day tasks are is currently we have Audrey in attendance in the interview, myself and Audrey in the committee in attendance in the interview. So she is able to answer any of those questions of the selected firms that are being interviewed. Um, if that is okay with council for her to be in, in the process. Yeah. Yes. Council, yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Council, any other thoughts or ideas? Pat, thank you. Thank you. Thank Larry, you. thank you. Bernie, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, do you wish to vote on whether you wish to issue the uh, draft RFL IQ? Make any uh, or, or the move uh, to approve. Second. Out. second. Okay. There's been a mo thank you, Audrey. There's been a motion and a second. Further discussion. Roll call, please. Councilwoman Carr. Aye. Mayor Simmons. Aye. Councilman O'Flynn. Aye. Councilman Gibson. Aye. Councilman Forbes. Aye. Councilwoman Carumba. Aye. Councilman Dewitt. Aye.
Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've got a, a walk on here, I guess, with an errata sheet. Chief, I know you're up against a deadline. Um, if we want to lay this out, uh, discuss and provide direction regarding the fire district's request for approval of a modified plan for the structure to cover equipment of station 27 on Hickory Boulevard. And this is green sheet 18050142. And I don't know who's teeing this up or where we are, but here it is. We're, we're gonna let the chief tee it. Yeah, okay, very good. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Mayor Joe. Okay. Is it still morning? Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just wanted to comment on, uh, we have been here before, comment on the, uh, the Cheeky Hut design to cover Station 27's apparatus. Um, I did look up the difference between Cheeky and Tiki. Cheeky is- <laughs> Yeah, what is it? It's Native American. Cheeky's Native American, Tiki is Polynesian. Ah. So, oh. depends on who builds it would make ah. the difference in the design. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry? Yes. 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 Um, just to uh, reiterate, I know the board and the, the council had um, determ tried to determine uh, which direction they would like to go, and it was uh, tabled um, with the idea that members of the council would visit with or talk to members of the fire board. And it's my understanding that there has been some conversation uh, between some council members and some members of the board. Um, with that in mind, um, we went back and redesigned the uh, Tiki Hut, Cheeky Hut, um, with the intention to try to make it look a little bit more pleasing. Um, when I did speak with the owner of the property, um, I, don't, I did want to read this if you haven't seen it, but the Benita Springs Fire Control and Rescue District is presenting the Cheeky Hut design as a fire apparatus cover for the mini pumper located at Station 27. The structure's intent is to reasonably shelter approximately 300,000 in taxpayers' emergency response assets from the elements. Included are advanced life support medications, mission critical electronics, and other fire rescue tools and equipment. The district does have a 99 year lease with the owner, which includes approximately 800 square feet of storefront property and dock space for water rescue operations. Not included is any of the parking area. Upon entering this lease, the owner and general manager made it clear that their primary business is the Big Hickory Seafood Grill and Marina, which is located on the property. Therefore, the fire district has maintained the intentions to limit our footprint in keeping with the agreement. The property manager was approached with the design options for our sheltering our, stru sheltering our structure and unequivocally preferred the Cheeky Hut design, which is similar to the Cheeky Hut design on their dockside dining uh, area. She indicated that she did not wish to consider the other designs at this juncture. Additionally, the Cheeky Hut is the only one of the three options presented to the city architect, presented by the city architect and the Benita Springs Fire Commission that has been authorized for pursuit due to cost. As a reference, there are approximately nine other designs visible from Benita Beach Road and Hickory Boulevard on the way to the Big Hickory Seafood Grill and Marina. Uh, in the fire district control rescue district would respectfully request that the city council approve the design as presented i think we had it you may have a picture um, of of the redrawn design um, when it, when this was brought to the fire board um, they uh, liked this design and understood what the city council's concern was um, so we made it look a little bit well a lot different we lowered it we also added a lot more foliage to uh, enhance the look. And I know the mayor asked about um, the elements from the certain side being open, so, and that was a good point. So we added lattice work to it to be more in line with the, uh, the uh, marina and seafood grill that is there. And I'm not sure if the council is aware or how many people have been out there, but that is a dirt parking lot. Um, so the fire board um, recognizes that this design would uh, be in line with the restaurant and also be an upgrade to what is there currently. So if I had any questions, please feel free. I have free. A two factual questions, Joe. Yes, sir. So the old height was 13 something feet and mm -hmm. I thought it had to be there because of the truck height or mm -hmm. the standards for the fire district. 
what's mm -hmm. happened there? This well, what probably. happened was we originally designed it to be able to fit a full uh, fire engine into that location for standby. Um, but since that, um, when we brought a full fire station down there, the owner did not like that at all. He said, we're not a fire department, we're a restaurant. So that was the original design. But now that we're um, in the position we're in, we understand that it would be, we probably will not have a larger fire truck standing by in that location. So it allowed us to lower it to fit the, uh, the basically a pickup truck, which is a mini rescue in that in that f in that under that uh, facility. Second factual question: Is it yes, sir? Uh, what am I looking here? Am I looking at Bougainvillea on Bougainvillea on a lattice? Yes, sir. You're looking at Bougainvillea closed in on the three sides. We didn't do a three-dimensional picture, but on three sides uh, or, or two sides, lattice work with uh, covered with flowers and palms in Bougainvillea. The two sides being the street side and the south side. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Council. Anything else? Any other questions? Or? I mean, I, I move I, to accept this, and I, I appreciate the effort that was made here. Um, and in my discussions with the fire board, I guess my one issue was is that I just was not pleased with the process that happened the last time, and it's, it was a much a, a disappointment in, um, I would say, community development as you, because when we have something brought before the council with the idea that this should, would be passed conditionally with variances and it was my understanding in the original thing that the fire board was supposed to come back with alternatives and when they came back to us the last time they said this take it or leave it basically is what they were saying so I was very annoyed with the process so I appreciate the effort that was made here and I do think that's an improvement in regard to uh, the atmosphere on uh, Hickory Boulevard and I, and I uh, you know, I can uh, appreciate the cost basis. And uh, when we all work together, things work out better, in my opinion. So thank you for the effort was here. And I, uh, I'm reasonably satisfied with the direction which we're going. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Amy. Well, and, and I'll second Mike, that before we yeah, start for further discussion. discussion. So. Yeah, OK. There's been a motion and a second. And I'm going to jump in. You know, we, we all received, I think we, yeah, we did. We all received it mm -hmm. from some residents down on Hickory Boulevard. Um, a notation here, you know, the fire district had constructive knowledge of the non-conforming building and the 50% rule before they signed the lease on the property. Even though they had that knowledge that they could not expand what they were leasing, they signed the lease. The council was gracious enough to approve an ordinance that reduced the setback from 25 feet to less than 3 feet. Part of the ordinance number seven states that any quote unquote structure used to store equipment outdoors are designed consistent with the existing building in terms of color, materials, and style. The existing building is not a cheeky hut. Back in 2006, the residents met at a public hearing at the firehouse on the other side of the interstate and the chief said that if the residents of the island didn't want a station on Hickory Boulevard, they wouldn't put one there. We didn't want it and we spoke against it, but for some reason we got it anyway. The council has more than accommodated the fire company in this matter. It is time to say enough is enough and protect the taxpayers from the island from the structure that does not meet number seven above. Uh, there were concerns, it goes on in this 50% uh, plus rule, it appears we should have been given information to be reviewed prior to approving the ordinance in 2016. Now, this is one resident's thoughts. We, we all got this memo, and I guess, Chief, uh, in fairness to every citizen, what would your response be to those thoughts? Um, yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. I had spoken with our board, and we did hold a... Um, rather well attended meeting when we were determining whether or not we were going to build a full fire station there. And um, the chairman understands that. He said when we decided that we were not going to build a full fire station and we're going to basically rent 800 square feet and put the um, substation there, um, there was a full house and they got a, the board got a full applause for the decision for the location which we had been looking for for 16 years. 
So the board is aware that there, there are certain residents that did not like that location. Um, however, they worked as well as we could to provide the level of service that to the to the uh, island as well. And I did want to note that um, when we're looking at placing these fire stations, it's not simply the residents that live there. We understand there's a risk analysis that we do in which we understand that we have over a million people that go to our state parks and travel to our beaches a year. So that comes into the decision for the board to approve the placing of a fire station as well. Um, to meet those, those um, demands with hurricanes and issues like that, um, I would have preferred professionally uh, to put a full fire station there. However, the board, and that was my recommendation initially, however, the board um, took into consideration the members and the community that lives there, and therefore we have what we have. Um, and it's done a very good job of protecting the citizens at this point. But they are aware of that there are some citizens that do not like. Right, and I just want to be clear because I thought I was clear, but then I'm not clear. What's the size of the truck? that we're looking at there, will that be changed? Will it be consistent? What are those dimensions? Those dimensions, it's a pickup truck, basically an F-550 with a box on the back. Um, it's maybe the box is typically maybe six foot mm -hmm. or so, and the typical length is what a, a F-550 would be. Uh, it has some a pumping capacity on it, so we do get some fire protection out of it. It's not just simply a rescue. Um, so it's basically like a regular F-550 driving down the road with lights on top of it. And Those that'll be consistent, that won't change? Yes, we are not adding a full pumper to that area. We have no intentions to. In fact, that was the agreement that we got into with the owner. He did not want the place to look like a fire station. Yeah, no, I, right, and in fact, yeah. um, sure. Uh, you and I had that conversation. Another question I have, yes, sir. and I'm sure you've done this, have you exhausted all possibilities of where, because it's, it's, it's a good sized truck, but it's not an enormous truck, mm -hmm. right? Have exhausted the possibilities of on that property, at that location, where that truck could go. So um, it'd be less intrusive to the folks, uh, to some folks. Yeah, we looked at areas on, the, the big issue with the, um, the owners is the parking space. And when we, we laid the pad down for that, and also mm -hmm. the emergency response, um, uh, getting out of the station quick, and also gear coverage as well. Um, there are other areas, one we did look at that would not require variance is just covering the parking spaces directly in front of the 800 square foot condo, which is directly in front, but that would require an overhang that will be similar or some, to some degree of uh, what we're proposing now at the Cheeky Hut. So it's the understanding between the owner and the fire district that the location where we have now is the most appropriate for the owner running his business and also our response. There are other areas. Um, I have not discussed that with the owner. They may say we don't want you in these parking areas or back around the side because if we move it to the other side of the building, the issue becomes response getting out during season because that parking lot, if any of you have been down there, which I'm sure you have, is jam-packed and then we may run into an issue of trying to get out of the parking lot while somebody else is trying to get in so direct access to hickory is of prime importance no no, no a absolutely and i think at the end of the day you could care less if that's parked on the end of the building right i mean it would be easier for you right. and your team if this we were able to put this truck somewhere else right not have to build the cheeky hut, not have to offend residents. You're just mm -hmm. looking to have it down there for public safety, right? You don't take any pride, uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, sure. necessarily any pride or any ownership and having to construct something down there that's A, not consistent with the existing building, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you're hearing that from the landlord and the owner mm -hmm. of the property. You're hearing from the residents mm -hmm. that it's not consistent. So... Am I correct in saying if there's a place to put this truck, not on the end of that building, mm -hmm. uh, you would be open to that, Chief? As long as it does not hinder operations. Uh, absolutely understood yes. completely. And as um, long as it was okay with the owner. Yeah, no, absolutely. Have mm -hmm. we exhausted that conversation, Chief, or have we not exhausted that conversation? We, I did discuss with the owner of putting it in the parking spot if you look at the building right. from where the parking is, taking up those three parking spots there and directing it out, 
but in any event, it's still going to require a cover. Um, that's the only place that I see right now, unless we put it, which would not be realistic, but that, that's the only other place that I would say would be convenient, but you're still going to have the same issue, people seeing the fire truck and the cover from the street, and they'll see the building, that whole side of the building will not be covered up, which whether you like the building or not, mm -hmm. the cheeky hut is going to cover up that whole side. Pardon me. Pardon Sorry. Me. We'll, we'll cover up that whole side of the building and with mostly trees and flowers. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So the other way, you'll have the, a cheeky hut of some sort with the truck facing this way, and that will be, I haven't even discussed this with the owner, that may hinder parking flow for them, as you know, it's overflown. So I have not discussed that with them, but that would be the only other um, realistic option because if we moved it further away we moved it behind the building we have a traffic problem with parking if we move it further away we have an issue of the crews running across the parking lot to try to get to a truck with people coming in and out so they have to have direct access to the vehicle for safety reasons you know right. and you know if it's raining and they go out a lot in thunderstorms running across the parking lot running electricity across the parking lot to um, to plug in the truck because we have tons of electronics in the truck right. so that's another another issue that we would have but right. to, to, to to whittle it down the spot we're talking about and the other spot would be the only two which has not been confirmed by the uh, with the owner right I mean because yeah. you're you're on a 99 year lease there right yes so I mean look there's been a lot of great progress made there's been a lot of great discussions I for one would be in favor to have that one last exhaustive final conversation if you would be open to that i'm open to whatever the council would like i just know that the fire board i have to bring that back to the fire board because um they instructed me to get a vote of one way or another before we move forward because this is what they're asking for right right but we're looking at a 99 year yes project yes. here yes i i will say that i know the fire board has discussed the possibility of um, down the line when something happens with that building or something happens with the owner of revamping the whole thing, knocking down the cheeky hut, rebuilding whatever we need to build depending on what happens with that building. Right. Um, so they're not, um, at the, well, it's this board is not opposed to that reality too. Right. You know, you can view the cheeky hut as somewhat of a temporary structure depending on what happens with the building mm -hmm. um, and that's the best answer I can give you sir. yeah no 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 absolutely and I realize people are looking for an answer here and uh, we, we all are I think but I where I said I'll just say it again and then I'll be quiet I think one last final 99 year conversation would <laughs> be warranted <laughs> yes sir well, one thing I, I'd like just like to pop in here one thing that uh, this resident say did say structure based uh, Structure used to store equipment outdoors designed consistent with the existing buildings, terms, color, and material. We tried that. Nobody on council liked it. We called it the gas station look. That was one of the options. Well, that was Sam's. That uh, was one of Sam's no, first we, li we liked that. I'm sorry, Greg. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. I don't think yeah. no one liked it. We called it the gas station look, and, right. and uh, how would we match it? So, you know. Sunoco I, blue, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's that what I original. mean. That was the one of the original ones. It was a tiki or as I think Mike called it, the gas station look, the, the awning right. look. So, I mean, But didn't this the owner, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, no. No, I'm just it's, saying. It's, it's I don't free know flowing. The, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, we're I'm good. just yeah. saying. Let me interrupt. <laughs> no, yeah, right. just, I'm just kind of answering these same questions as the chief did. We looked at the, this council didn't like that look of the gas station right. awning look. So we were, we did do our due diligence as a council and as the fire department, we tried to, make it fit in with the building and it didn't no one up here liked it and but nor did the owner and the owner wouldn't approve it correct correct the owner the their primary business like you understand is the the seafood marina mm -hmm. and they have the cheeky hut design and that is in line with their motif mm -hmm. in which they said that they would like to see because it shows you know seaside restaurant type of atmosphere is what they, which what they really want it to be, not a fire department. And if you put the Tiki Hut in front of the fire station, you wouldn't need City Hall to say yay or nay, correct? 
if we were out, it's my understanding, if we were outside the variance, um, we would not need the, um, the approval because we're getting the approval because of the variance. But then that design would have the truck facing the, the people passing by yes. right in your face. This new design is really nice. It's almost, you can't even see it. And it does match with the um, structures in the back mm -hmm. of where we're talking about. It's my understanding when, when I drive down, I'm gonna take the liberty here, but when I drive down Hickory Boulevard, I see a lot of similar, very similar um, decor with the plants and flowers that we're looking to do in front of the Cheeky Hut that are essentially gonna rise above the Cheeky Hut and even hide some of the Cheeky Hut as the you know, palm trees grow and whatnot. So um, the other way, the fire truck will be forward and you can never place anything in front of that fire truck. So you won't be able to cover up the, the front of the fire truck if we're looking to hide fire trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they are. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm not really sure going back and having another conversation is going to help matters. I mean, I think we're kind of here or in the front, and I think that more people would have issues with the truck in the front than on the side, really nicely covered and um, sweet. I don't know. Council, anything else? Yeah, um, I tend to agree with Peter on this uh, for kind of another reason, which is I talked to Joe outside about this, um, Chief. Um, this uh, structure or any structure was not allowed at this site. Uh, that's what the variance was about. In other words, you guys had a three foot setback. You couldn't, side setback, you couldn't have put a truck there. Mm -hmm. So I went back and looked at the tape from two, two, October 2016. And the, the bargain there, so to speak, was, okay, we'll basically blow away that side setback, allow this, but in return, there are concerns of the residents in that area. Um, not about, I, I agree with, not the macro issue, we're gonna have a fire station there, so to speak, for emergency response and everything else you do, but about the Tiki Hut look. Um, and those objections, uh, the first meeting of the zoning board, Barbara, Barbara Buchanan talked about that for 15 minutes, and also at city council. Um, and at that time, and times change, but it, even the district was saying, we're not hung up on the Tiki Hut look. So there were concerns about that, and then we had the other one that Greg's talking about that was even a more major concern, and then Sam came along with the very aesthetically pleasing third thing. So to me, here we are a year and a half later, and where we were in October 2016, well, thanks for the variance, but we want the Tiki Hut. Um, so respectfully, I think it's important for our friends at the district board to understand that, that that was the bargain that was made. Now, having said that, um, th this Tiki Hut is lower than the other. It does show kind of a hiding uh, effect with the lattice, so you can't see it. I think a little time is needed for outreach to the residents on the beach to have them take a look at this. I, I, I mean, to me, I would kind of go for it, but we specifically have in here sensitive to nearby residences. That's what's actually in the ordinance. And um, I think a little more time to have them understand that um, would be good for the collegiality of our community. So whatever outreach, however that can be done, I think that would be appropriate, C together with what Peter said. Yeah. And, and, I, and I don't know, I'll just jump in here for a second. Um, there, you know, I think we could be, you know, we're, we're, Amy's looking at, we're doing some workshops, and uh, I, I've heard, had more than one resident approach me about doing a town hall meeting uh, you know, town hall meetings don't have to be only about one issue. They can be a hodgepodge, a soup to nuts, hey, whatever's on your mind type town hall meeting. Uh, if council's open to that or, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm just kind of lobbing that out there. Uh, there are issues 
always issues in town and um, some folks that w while they certainly know about the meetings may or may not choose to attend a 9 a.m. or a 5.30 meeting, but may attend a town hall meeting. I don't know. I'm not saying we have to have a town hall meeting, but uh, there again, these, these one last final 99-year conversations on this and any other conversations that people felt strongly about the town, I, for one, would be happy to organize a town hall meeting. So just a thought. And council, any more questions on this? No, I think we've got a motion and a second. We should vote on it. Okay, there's a motion and a second. And what is the motion? So approve. To approve. To accept the design of the cheeky head as presented. I'd like to make the motion to amend, um, which is that uh, in that connection, we would first have an appropriate outreach to the residences, having them understand that yes, this is a tiki hut or cheeky hut, but it's not the one that was 13 feet up in the air. It's got some shading and have a reasonable conversation and input from them on that. That's my motion. Well, I'll second it with the, with the amendment to the amendment. Yeah. With it being the same that we would do for a normal zoning, 350 feet or 375 feet. Uh, well, so that's what it is. It's so narrow there uh, that, uh, uh, that if you, I'm just okay. to interrupt. I'm saying, <laughs> okay. I apologize to interrupt, but that's what you, when you went back and read it, it's right. to the surrounding people, not the entire island. Not we're not going to put a poll out for the visitors, as the chief said. There's a million visitors come through. How many people we're going to have? That's what we normally do for for zoning is 375 feet. Well, why we, should we change that? Uh, I think we should vote on the first. Will you? Uh, you have to vote on the amendment first. First. Amendment first. We yeah. have an amendment. We gotta get we a, second. a second. Right, you gotta get a I second. I thought you just seconded. Well, no? No, he was trying to add something. Oh. What's the First Amendment, to be clear? I think the First Amendment was to have, at, uh, con consistent with Condition 6 of Ordinance Number 1606, to have um, acceptance of the design of the Cheeky Hut, that's the original motion, after outreach to residents of scale and height in accordance with Condition 6, at which point there was a second amendment that came up to the floor. Yep. which was um, acceptable provided that it follows the traditional zoning of nearby residential uses, which is actually what the condition states, uh, would be limited to the 375 feet, which is your normal zoning uh, perimeter. I believe you have to vote on the First Amendment first, assuming it gets a second. Well, well, and his second was only applied if you well, I, agreed Mike, to I his. Agree. So. Greg did not second it for purposes of seconding. So he wanted to add something. Right. Did anybody second your amendment? No. Anybody second mine to reach out to the people out there and talk to them? Uh, I will he definitely did. second I, that, yes, but I wouldn't want to limit it to 350 feet. Right, well, it hasn't been done yet. Okay. Right. Yep. I, I, I will definitely I second that. I just have that. a question about this outreach. Other than informing residents, what's the purpose? Are we, are we uh, going to, uh, wait, let me finish oh, just okay. a minute. All right. Uh, is it that if there was a very negative um, response that we would not vote on the, very, on the uh, Cheeky Hut? My, what my, is my, the my point of this, and it's not, Audrey read something I didn't say, all right? Uh -huh. the height, this, that, and the other thing, all right? My point is that um, someone made a point in an email that struck home with me. What if this was outside your house, okay? In your neighborhood. So we have a beautiful residential neighborhood down there uh, from stem to stern, and they have standards. And uh, to me, I'm trying to bring the formalities of this council to the real world of those people. Uh, these are the people of Bonita Springs that we represent. So I don't have um, so to me, that's not measured by three, three, 350 feet, et cetera. It's a reasonable outreach, and we know who the primary people who have spoken up are. Um, and uh, just say, what do you think about this? I think my personal view is, I think this is a heck of a lot better than what was presented in October of 2016. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's a courtesy to the neighborhood mm -hmm consistent with the fact mm -hmm. that this started with a variance that otherwise wouldn't have existed, that they wouldn't have allowed to have a structure there, and the trade-off was concern about what the residents thought about it. So I'm just trying to bring the kind of that real world into our formalities. But on the same token, yeah, I'm sorry, if you go, go ahead. No, I'm just thinking about what he's saying, go ahead. But on the same token, 
if we decide to go away from the variance, let's say the fire board comes in June's meeting and says, all right, the city council is not going to give it to us. We go to the owner and we take the first three parking spots in front of the station. We do not need a variance. We do not need any outreach. We put a tiki hut there. Right. And they get it proverbial shoved down their throat. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's looking to do that. So, well, but, so what I, we, but we what are I'm looking trying. to get the, the to help out the fire department to get their equipment, which is taxpayers' money, covered and protected. Coming into a hot time of year. I understand that, and I, I don't think this. And it's one, and we've had one letter, not an outcry. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's representative of a general view, and I think we need to be sensitive to the people. I don't think it's going to take a long time, and. My personal view is this looks a heck of a lot better. I just think it's appropriate to, to, ha to have that outreach. And I would suggest a district person do it. It's, it's not my district. And it, and it can be done by the next weekend, uh, by the next meeting, and um, just get feedback. I'm not saying that they have an up or down on it, but let's get their feedback. Well, it is my district, and I'll scan the picture and send it to the people right now. Can yeah, we have a motion to second? Can I ask? Talking. Yeah. Yeah, Fred. <clears throat> I could go along with this if we could get this whole outreach meeting done so we could break break <laughs> ranks and vote on it up or down at the meeting on the 22nd. I think it could be done because it's, it's not a big group to get it done if they want to be proactive. I think that's fine. But if council has completed its debate, you are <laughs> to first vote, uh, vote on whether you agree to the amendment to the motion, then you would vote on the um, motion in principle. Right. For the outreach. But that goes first. R that would be the yeah. second, right, that the would amendment. Be outreach would, yeah, the, okay. Well, and no. just to Fred's point, uh, we can't vote on the 22nd because that's a workshop, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So you can, we could reschedule something could that we could vote. We could reschedule this for June 6th. No, uh, we could reschedule that. So th couldn't that be done in the way we could vote? Yeah. Um, or are you too tight on what? It, you're probably tight on the subject matter, but also I will not be able to be at May 22nd. I was going to talk to council about okay. that later on. But um, I, I think we just really need to move this along. Um, the, the email in question did come after it, it, it implies that they've seen the green sheet, so they've seen this new picture. So I, I don't see why there's a, a holdup or, or more outreach. Okay. So uh, call the question. Yep. There's been a motion and a second. The question's been called. And, and just to be clear. And this is on the amendment only. Right. So this is on whether to amend the uh, principal motion to accept the Cheeky Hut, the amendment being after outreach to the residents. May I, sir? Yes, sir. Um, I know that uh, I personally in my position, I'm under pressure to have some cover under over that truck in the meantime until this gets resolved one way or another. So I'm going to need to do that in the meantime until this process comes So what's the soonest down. we can ha uh, have a, me a meeting? I, I think Fred makes a fair if point. It's not going to take two weeks. To or what else? More than two weeks. Sir, and we could do it on May 16th, and uh, Carly will be uh, here. Today's the 16th. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, until yeah. May 22nd. If you wanted to continue okay. this. Uh, so that I think that would be time. good. It just gives a few days. Notice it, then we'll, and then, then just we'll notice vote. the meeting as that portion of the meeting will be your regular meeting, the continuation Appreciate portion. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards. Yeah. Okay. And, and what defines outreach? Um, council outreach is what council feels is outreach. Yeah, whatever you're comfortable with. I would it could do be what just you said you were going to do. <laughs> but as um, Mike pointed out, they've seen the green sheet. Um, so they've seen the photo. If I'd be happy to do it if you don't want to. I, mean, I was going to say, or I would be, uh, too. No, Either way, it, yeah. Okay. All right, I, mean, I, I, I just I think in this day and age, I mean, I don't know, uh, an email and a phone call or phone calls um, to some folks, but um, whatever. A lot of people out of town, but they have that association down there, so I can call right. them BIA or Right. Pardon? Or BIA, the, B, the BBIA. And have an e they have an email list that's pretty comprehensive. Yeah, and they can email this photo too if you're going to get into it. I mean, this. I'm not suggesting friendly. you have to talk to 50 people or 100 people. Mm -hmm. It's just a, just a sense of the people who have most had the objections to explain this and have a reasonable conversation. If you're and asking I, what I would do, I would suggest that the chief come and give his 
point of view, which I think is important. And uh, we're sort of doing something similar to that with, I mean, the council didn't vote on it because w it was a conventional zoning with NCH. Um, it, when NCH is putting in that 24 hour and they, um, I mean, we didn't have anything to do the council with approving what they're doing there if they just had a straight development order. But they've come to the neighboring communities after they already started building and mm. saying this is what we're doing and they just were talking to the community. The community seemed to like that but it was not, but the approval was not contingent <coughs> on having that. But I, it's always good to have an interaction with communities where they're most immediately affected. Um, so as long as we do this at a timely basis, <coughs> I'll be in favor of this amendment to do outreach whatever Laura wants to devise, but I think we need to vote on it on the 22nd, and I'm in favor of it. I mean, I'll vote in favor of it, so it'll, you got at least one vote. I don't know about anybody else, but. Um, well, and I would just say, um, I mean, I think, I, in fact, I know, never mind, I think, I know what you and your department do is outstanding, and your outreach and your community involvement is outstanding, so I have zero doubt this will be any different to reach out to some folks, kind of last call, for this 99-year decision, and I'll just leave it at that. And Mike has called the question, so in case anybody's really upset, we're going to call the question and hey, vote. Well, yes, I got one last comment. If, if I may, I think the motion then, because of the uh, amendment to the motion changing the nature of the original motion, you may wish to just have the motion to continue this matter to May 22nd uh, at 9 a.m. or uh, council meeting. Um, after outreach, you know, at which time there has been outreach to the residents, and that way you can vote on the principal motion oh, at that good. time. It doesn't make sense to say you're going to accept it, but it's after something happens, but you're having it continue to a time. Okay, Greg, you had something. Well, so. I'm just, I'm, I'm just concerned, and I know Amy uh, brings it up, a good point up. Is procedurally, I mean, we don't do this with any other thing. We've had a lady come here for the last three meetings asking to have Alta paint and tell us where those neighborhoods are along East Terry. And we haven't done anything about it to tell Alta. I know Mike brought it up and I wanted a temporary one. But now that we get one letter about a structure that we've been talking about for almost two years, now we're putting the brakes on this thing. I mean, it's no different than what's going on with the downtown thing, which we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. It just seems like we keep kicking the can down the road for, in this case, one letter. We didn't get a, a, a letter from the BVIA. We didn't get a letter from the president of the BVIA. Right. We didn't get numerous letters from residents along Hickory Boulevard, or the island as they call it. We've got one concerned citizen, and it just seems like uh, it, it's Councilwoman Carr's district. She's, whatever she's gonna vote, she's gonna vote that. It just seems like they've been informed enough. How much mm. more information do they need? As Mike and everybody's put out there, they've seen the email. Obviously, they're paying attention to city politics. They're paying attention to what's going on. It just seems like that we, that we're one person, the, sque the proverbial squeaky wheels getting all this grease, but we're not doing it for everybody else. I, I wouldn't go there, really, because, uh, you know, I mean, I, c I could go on about how th this was turned down a year and a half ago and why is the district coming back, but I, I don't do that. Well, it so, wasn't turned so down. So, no, so, so I'd just rather not personalize it. and. Just my own personal view. I have people entitled to do what they want. And I would just say more, more involvement, more feedback uh, in a, for a matter of days. And I'll say it again, for a 99-year decision, to me, more is more. More is not less here. Um, I didn't know that we had a um, gun to our head to get this decision today. If we do, I've misheard the chief. They want an answer. We're going to give them an answer in a few days. Questions, Fred? Okay, the well, question's I, been called. I don't know why I'm we're continuing, well, but I, I, nobody I, seconded the call on the question. That's yeah. why. Well, <laughs> just, just gonna, excuse me a second, Audrey. <laughs> Under Robert's rules, it's, well, forget it. Person, forget it. Yeah. Got it. But we can't. What do you want to know? But uh, if we're going to Individual vote council members can't call a question. All right. right. But the mayor calls the question. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay, the mayor, has, the mayor is calling the question. Okay. Is there a second to that? No, you do not need a second to right. call. Okay, the, qu <laughs> the question's been called. Audrey, Roll thank call, you. Please, and we're voting just to continue it to the 22nd, correct, Audrey? Was that's your suggestion? Not, no, that's With instructions for Council Member uh, Carr to The question has been called, Amy. I'm, I'm, we're no, we're no, voting. No, Roll call, please. No, we, we don't, that's Mayor, not the motion. 
excuse me mayor we cannot call the question because the question we're voting on is that we're accepting the very the proposal here with the amendment that we're going to have outreach of some sort in order to vote on what you want to do i think i have to withdraw my motion and propose a motion most along the lines that audrey said where we're going to continue the whole thing with giving direction to whoever we are going to to have an outreach i second that motion if we want to vote we're voting on the wrong thing audrey is that needed i think Helpful. You eloquently put it, yeah. and I think Councilmember O'Flynn Seconded. eloquently stated yeah. it. The motion now on the table, right. there were some withdrawals of motions. The motion now on the table is to continue this item for to May 22nd, uh, subject to during that time Councilmember Carr sending an outreach uh, to affected residents or nearby residents um, of the uh, design to get their input before your final vote. Mm. Outstanding. Roll call, please. Mayor Simmons. Aye. Councilman O'Flynn? Aye. Councilman Gibson? No. Councilman Forbes? Aye. Councilwoman Carumba? Aye. Councilman DeWitt? No. Councilwoman Carr? No, but I'll do the outreach. <laughs> no. <laughs> Motion passes 4 3. Did it Excellent. Pass? <laughs> thank you, everybody. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chief, very much. Yes, sir. Appreciate thank you. all your efforts. I know you got your hands full and. Welcome to our world. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, buddy. <laughs> I've got two, two boards to, to <laughs> it's, it's, go We'll, we'll so. split hairs and drill down <laughs> yeah. together and we'll get there. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you. Yes, Fred. I want to just make a note. I know Amy said that she would be voting for this. I will be too. So, in favor of it. Wonderful. Okay. We've bounced around here a little bit, but um, if we can now move on to the presentation by PACE industry representatives on property assessed clean energy. PACE Financing, uh, Why Green. Hello, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, do I need a clicker? Is this the clicker? You get it? Josh, okay. Good morning, Mayor um, and, and Council Members. My name is Natalie Schneider. I represent Renew Financial. However, we're coming as four different PACE providers before you to talk about property assessed clean energy. And this dovetails in with a lot of things that you were discussing this morning. You were talking about you know, making homes more resilient. You were talking about hurricanes. So what this is, is, and what I'm gonna do is, because I hate, I hate animations. <laughs> there we go. This is a program, it's a financing tool. It's one among many that um, we, want, we are hoping that Bonita Springs actually joins up in partnership <coughs> with us to bring to your property owners, just as of a number of other places across Florida and indeed across the country. And we, this, this is something that finances energy efficiency, renewable energy or wind mitigation projects that are attached to the home, attached to the property. So if it's creating um, renewable energy, if it's saving energy, or if it's making your property stronger against hurricanes and other storms, it's a type of financing to help people pay for those types of improvements. It's both residential and commercial. It runs a little differently for residential and commercial. There are a lot more consumer protections for residential um, property owners. Um, commercial, a lot of times they, they you know, some of the pro projects are a lot larger, so they're more um, financially savvy to understand, so it's a, a slightly different between the two. But what this does is it enables long-term savings, both from a sustainability side, so greenhouse gas emission side, which is where the inception for this came from, really, is to reduce a carbon footprint. But also what it does is it reduces both your energy bill and it also reduces your insurance bills depending on what type of improvement you do to your property. It also supports local economic development. What we do as the PACE provider, we don't have contractors that are our contractors. We go into the, the community, we work with local contractors to help certify them to offer this as a financing tool among other financing tools that they offer people. And then it also furthers regional um, energy efficiency and resiliency goals. So what we see the most of are, are having people redoing their roofs in anticipation 
in anticipation of hurricane season or after a hurricane hits, they need to redo their roofs, um, uh, in impact windows, storm shutters that are affixed to the home, AC units, also you know things such as um, solar panels, but we'll get into that a little later. It's really expanded across the United States. It started just over 10 years ago out in California. And right now, we're in, in about, in some form or fashion, 30 states. That is commercial. And in residential, we're in three states. Right now, we're in California, we're in Florida, and we're in uh, Missouri, I believe, or Minnesota, one of the two. But we're also moving into New York City, um, Pennsylvania is looking at it, Ohio is looking at it, Colorado is looking at it. They've all started enacting um, legislation such as we have at the state level to bring pace to their residents in these states. So right now, Florida was actually one of the innovators of this type of financing. And to date, because this is, this is a couple months old at this point, this is a conservative number. These numbers are actually higher at this point with the number of projects completed across the United States, jobs created, and how much financing has been approved. And again, this is a little stale right now as well. It's showing you that you are now hopefully embarking on a, a program, a, a way <coughs> to help people uh, give them another option to pay for these types of improvements. Let's see, Brevard County right now has signed on. Um, we, Cape Coral has recently signed on. Uh, Fort Myers had signed on. We are finalizing some um, documents with Sarasota County right now. So this is something that has really picked up momentum in bringing this to your residents, to your business owners, to be able to help them make those improvements that'll help reduce their energy bills and actually help them weather storms better. There we go, paid animations. So right now, it's over 125 have one or more PACE programs. And the way it works is that I represent, for example, Renew Pace, the second one in on the bottom. We are a third party administrator to a local government that has been established similar to the South Florida Water Management District or Southwest Florida Water Management District. Ours is called Florida Green Finance Authority. Its board is made up of sitting members of different local municipalities. Ours in particular is Lantana and Alachua County, uh, Mangonia, West Palm Beach. So we have a number of local municipalities who are interested enough to start this particular um, local government. And then what we do is we enter into interlocal agreements, the Florida Green Finance Authority, Clean Energy Corridor, um, Florida Resiliency and Energy District, which is FRED, and Florida Pace Funding Agency would enter into an interlocal agreement so that you would allow us to operate here. There is no imperative, there is no, nothing for your individual lo local municipality to do. It would essentially be saying, yes, we want to be part of this type of district to allow this type of assessment on people's properties. And what you're going to see is, and my colleagues, I have here Devesh Nirmal with uh, y Green and also Mike Antile with Renovate America, they're going to get into it a little more as to how it operates. So right now, I'm going to um, hand it over to Devesh, but we're all here to answer questions a after the presentation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, yeah, Mayor and, and uh, Council. Uh, Devesh Nirmal, I'm with Y Green, uh, Regional Director based out of Tampa Bay, Florida. Um, let's move ahead here. So I kind of want to, so a lot of us have different backgrounds in the industry. Uh, my, my background is actually working on energy and sustainability issues, just like uh, my colleague Natalie has um, quite a bit in the private and public sector. And, you know, I, I think the, the pay statute in Florida is unique to the challenges we face in Florida and trying to make this a, a state where we can all thrive and be resilient and, uh, and have long-term uh, economic and, and overall quality of life benefits. And the reality is if you think about what happened in Florida, we only had an energy code in our buildings as of 1992. And we had a failed insurance market back in maybe 10 plus years ago. And PACE came in at a time to say, how do we actually uh, direct private capital to really make these two, two things work better for us in the state? And so when we talk about lowering utility bills, all of us providers are only able to finance uh, energy uh, performing or, or in the case of wind mitigation, wind mitigation credit qualifying products that 
meet standards that allow for the potential savings. I can tell you honestly, I've heard from contractors that somebody might get a new set of windows, impact windows or a roof. Uh, they end up get, getting a discount from citizens insurance and they end up going to the private sector for insurance. They get out of citizens, which is obviously a goal of citizens. Um, and often these benefits are crossover. You may get high impact windows, you get the energy savings to go with that. You get the quality of work that comes with the type of um, management that we put into this. So the key things here are folks are faced with the challenging upfront costs, whether you do solar, roof, high impact windows. PACE provides a way to, to mitigate that and get the right solution, get something that is permitted and qualified. And, um, and the payback lines up with the return on investment. So we have, we only finance for the useful life of the products. Um, I would like to, I know Mike's gonna get into some more a bit later about the contractors. So I think it's the only thing I've seen in the marketplace where we are actually vetting, training and qualifying contractors and managing how they actually implement. When things go wrong, we are able to say, sorry, we're gonna stop the program. If for you to use this financing, we need to retrain you, have this fixed in order for you to continue. It's a leverage that I haven't seen before uh, to make sure work gets done right. I mean, obviously Mike will go through, I think one of the key benefits is payment doesn't happen until uh, the customer is signed off and satisfied. Let me move ahead here. Uh, so back to the state statute really quick. Uh, once again, we can only finance qualifying products that meet the statute's uh, categories, uh, energy efficiency, wind resistance, and renewables. Um, they ha are affixed to the property, the building or facility, as Natalie mentioned. We give notice 30 days to the existing um, uh, mortgage provider lender. Uh, and the protections that we have in place is that the, you can only qualify if you are not delinquent on um, your, your taxes or payments on the property, no in involuntary liens, no notices of default, and you're current on mortgage debt. Uh, there's a limit of, uh, you have to have a minimum of 10% equity in your property, and we can only finance at the threshold of 20% of existing just value. So there's a, uh, a window which in which we can operate um, to make sure that the customer is the right customer uh, based on those considerations. Um, let me move on. So these, these are just some examples. We have product lists. We have actually groups within our company, <coughs> committees that look at products and review them and qualify them. Um, it's not something you'll find that kind of care or oversight through any other home improvement financing vehicle. Um, as you can see, these fit those general categories I mentioned above. I think with the storm event last year, you may have folks that are looking to get their insurance claim um, process. They may have a blue tarp roof, for example. You know, PACE can make sure that the right solution comes into play, that you actually fix it with something that will sustain the next storm. And you can use your, your claim money when you get it to pay off whatever balance. There's no prepayment penalty in, in PACE for residential PACE. Um, on the commercial side, really quick, uh, a lot of advantages to commercial owners to get immediate building improvement, building value improvements and net operating income improvements by cutting that energy cost down without showing that on the balance sheet. It's recovered through the taxes. So that's the main selling point of this. We see some hotels in Florida. We see certain classes of buildings starting to pick up on this uh, value added uh, process for, through PACE. Um, I know I have to get to Mike here really quick, so I'm gonna pass it on. Mike, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hey Mike, welcome. Hello, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I uh, appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mike Antile, my company is Renovate America. We are a third, uh, three, a third out of four uh, total providers that represent a district. Um, I know it's been a long morning, so I'll go quick and see if we can bring this in for a landing and then we'll get into questions if you have any. Um, so I'll start here. This is really the most important part of PACE. This is what makes PACE different than any other type of financing are the consumer protections that are in place. It's the important part to remember Hurricane season is upon us. It's raining outside as we speak. People are thinking, okay, my roof, my windows, my doors, we're doing everything, you know, in our mind that we have to, uh, to do to get ready for the hurricanes. And if you do decide you do need a roof, uh, right now, essentially, it is the way that you, were to pur you are to purchase that roof is the same way you always would. It's you, it's your credit card, it's, uh, you know, Craigslist or Angie's List or whatever the best advice you can get. Uh, versus the world, right? I mean, what makes PACE different are the consumer protections that we bring to the table. Uh, a way to look at us, the two companies that have spoken so far, as well as the fourth who's not here today, um, essentially we are finance institutions, kind of a way to look at us as, as banks. We are the ones that loan the money 
uh, or, or we are the ones that put the money in play to the contractors, and it gives us the an additional ability to hold the contractor's feet to the fire. So this is six or seven um, of the types of uh, consumer protections we put in place. There's probably another six or seven on top of this, but each one of our companies has a very kind of mechanized, rigorous process that we go through to make sure that we are able to hold the contractor's feet to the fire. Just a couple of them real quick. Product performance requirements. You're not going to get uh, a subpar uh, windows and doors. You're not going to get a subpar air conditioner with our program. We uh, make sure that they meet at minimum Department of Energy standards as well as several other standards in order for a product to even be approved within our system. If it's a lousy air conditioner system, we're not going to approve it. We're not going to finance the project. Contractor requirements. Um, again, this is probably one of the biggest roles that we play. We hold those contractors' feet to the fire, but we vet them, we train them, we we look and make sure that these are companies that we're willing to do business with, we're willing to uh, to put our name on the line with, and that they're companies that have a, a track record in the local community. Again, we're our job is to partner with local contractors, uh, and that they actually have a track record of doing the right thing by the customers here locally. Fair pricing requirements. Essentially, the idea here is that if a contractor comes in and he's bidding you $12,000 for a roof that has, or, or I should say, let's say $12,000 for an air conditioner that in 99 out of 100 other cases normally goes for $8,000, that's a red flag in our system. We have the ability to pick up the phone and get an explanation from the, co from the contractor and we'll halt the process before it goes any further. Now, sometimes there is an explanation. It's an antique home or whatever the case may be. The duct work might be different in some places than others. Sometimes there's not a good explanation and then we flag that as a bad actor and our job is to get that bad actor either back on the right uh, uh, page or we're booting them from the program or we're even possibly even making the case uh, for the authorities. Um, dispute resolution is something essentially after the project is funded we have the ability to, uh, to intermediate in between any pr uh, resolutions. But the way that we avoid that the vast majority of the time is we're not actually going to pay the contractor until the homeowner has signed off and said, project is good, I'm satisfied, you know, everything is uh, the way that I was told. And then we will go through and pay the contractor for the work. And then senior protections, you know, we drew the line at the age 65. That's not to say you're a senior if you're over the age of 65, but we've got to draw a line somewhere. And we have several extra layers that we'll put into place there. In particular, we all listen to the calls. So when we're on, um, we give the, the homeowner, when it comes down to the actual nuts and bolts of financing the project, we'll actually give them a form called Know Before You Owe. And it spells out everything that you're going to pay, every, all the interest rates um, throughout the lifetime of the of the financing what you will end up paying the entire time all the fees everything associated with it. it's a very simple you know simple piece of paper so that um, pretty much anyone can grasp very quickly what the financial implications are and then we'll actually walk through that uh, form with the homeowner on the phone and again if it's somebody over the age of 65 we'll take extra measures to make sure that they're crystal clear on kind of what the implications are of this uh, uh, of this type of financing so I could go on and on about consumer protections because that's my thing, but I will uh, skip to the next slide. How do I do that? Right here? Nope, I went the wrong way. I'll be real quick from here on in. Um, this is, oh, I see you made that change. You're <laughs> well, anyway, th so this is just, these are the, the players that are involved. Essentially, we're the third party administrator uh, and we are the conduit between uh, the county tax collector. Ultimately, the way that the homeowner pays this assessment back is it shows up as an additional uh, non ad valorem voluntary line item on their property taxes. All right, so we pay the contractor, the homeowner pays that line item back, and then the tax collector ultimately remits that payment to us. We do have a relationship in place with the Lee County tax collector already because the city of Cape Coral and the city of Fort Myers uh, have a program that's been approved. Of course, we'd love to see you be third, and I think Estero would be uh, right on your heels. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the role that we play the, as the intermediary between the contractors, the tax collector, uh, 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 and the homeowner. So, oh, there's the tax collector right there. I see what you did. Okay, all right, I see. Very interactive. Um, these are all the different stakeholders in the process. I won't waste your time with that, but we can certainly dig into this if you'd like to get any further. Of course, we believe that the orange circle there, the tenants and the homeowners, are the ones that benefit the most. Um, just a couple of things real quick. I won't, I won't read through all this, but this is just kind of some common concerns that we hear. Um, so, again, we can come back and dig into any of this if you would like to. Um, the only thing that I would identify on this is interest rates, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, the interest rates are fixed. Well, we can get into that, all that on the next slide. Property appraiser I told you about. Consumer protections versus everything else I told you. That really is what makes PACE different. Um, and I think we covered all that. So we'll come back to that if you would like to get into any of that. 
Um, this is just an idea of interest rates. The only thing I would point out on this slide, so if you see in kind of column two there, the HELOC is, 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 is going to be better money, right? I mean, we're not here to say that we are the absolute cheapest money on the street. We're not here to say that this is the single uh, cheapest money on the street. But what we would say is, number one, the HELOC is subject to variable rates. We are not. That fixed rate that you see in the left column, the example pace column, that's a fixed rate. Um, we see uh, interest rates going as low as about 3%, as high as about, you know, eight, eight a quarter there. Um, that's amongst all the four PACE providers. Um, but the, the second column under HELOC, uh, again, this is a low interest rate environment that we're currently in. Um, this is specifically the reason that I'm using PACE on my house is because I happen to be a believer. I have, I mean, not that you need to hear my background, but I am a, 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 a commercial finance guy as a background. I happen to believe that we are entering into a higher interest rate uh, environment. I think it's going to continue to get higher, but that's just my personal belief. Um, so that's the reason that I'm using PACE, because I think that if I did take HELOC, and first of all, HELOC is not going to be um, that easy for a three, four, five thousand uh, dollar, um, you know, air conditioner or, or some windows and doors. They're usually looking for the roofs and that type of thing. But nevertheless, that HELOC is subject to, uh, to variable rates, whereas PACE is locked in through the duration of the term. And of course, unsecured, you're getting in your 11 and 12 percent rates there. And then, of course, we're blowing that one out of the water. And same thing with credit cards. I mean, you know, we, we have vastly superior rates to, to, to folks like that, whether it's unsecured or, uh, or personal credit. So I could talk about interest rates all day, but I won't. And that was it. I tried to get you a little bit back on schedule by going as fast as I could. So I will stop there. By all means, we'll take questions, and Devesh can answer the hard questions. Great. So I'll start. Council, much your pleasure. Fred? A lot of the people <clears throat> end up paying cash. So how do you help them? The homeowner who pays cash, uh, we, we don't help. I can tell you, I can come up with a couple scenarios how we could help them. And they take out a, a loan and pay it off? Well, exactly. So, so w w there's no prepayment penalties with PACE. So if I said to myself, okay, look, I'm going to put on this roof, but I know in six months from now I'm going to have $20,000, whether it's from an insurance claim, an inheritance, tax return, whatever the case may be, I can enter into this assessment now, protect myself for hurricane season, and then when that cash influx comes in, I can pay this loan off with no prepayment penalty. Okay. Second, second question is, if you're, it's almost kind of like a little special district tax assessing district in a way but it's voluntary correct taxes how is there a governing board and if there is how are those people appointed or elected or whatever right very good question um Devesh, if you want to talk about that you can i'll go back to your uh, your slide there but so essentially we are um each we are third-party administrators okay right. renovate america is a third-party administrator for a district that taxing district is formed by cities and counties each one of us has our own district we're Fred, Green Corridor, Florida Green Finance uh, Authority. Um, and those boards or those cities came together to form this, this taxing, taxing district. Under 163, it's eligible for the entire state. The way that we, our boards work, are different, though. Um, the, if you want to talk about oversight and how your board works, you know, have at it. But essentially, um, the way that our board works is we, we will, um, we have two founding members, and then we've, active, we've actively sought out additional members. Their job is to, uh, number one, you know, hold our feet to the fire as third-party administrators, and make sure that these are good quality projects, and ultimately they will turn around and issue the bonds, and uh, well, that's the way we do it, in order to, uh, to finance the projects. I got two real simple last questions. Are your board members compensated? No. Okay. And uh, the other one, is there any additional monies that you earn some way other than this fee that's collected through this uh, self-taxing thing? Our companies, no. It's a, there is an upfront fee, and, there's a, and we make a, a piece of the interest rate, and that is it. Those are the ways that we make our fees. So if, so if I was to buy, say I'm going to buy a new roof, $30,000, I'm going to pay cash, but I, in order to get to service, I agree to self-put that on my tax duplicate. So what's the upfront fee that I pay for that $30,000 roof? So for ours, we're 5% upfront, and then it's the interest rate on top of that. 6%, okay. 5 to 6% yeah. upfront, and then the interest rate that's and associated. And I, I will say this in your, to support what you're saying, more people down in Florida, there's more, we have a higher percentage of unscrupulous bad contractors, <coughs> I think. We've got a lot of good ones, but we sure as heck got a lot of ones that 
once you get hooked up with them, you wish you never had the experience. And if you screw up a roof, that's a, an inv a big investment that's supposed to be good for 25, 30 years. So I, I, think, I think I could support this thing. Great. Thanks, Fred. Council? Amy? Uh, you are basically a private um, financial institution. Correct. So you like you direct these loans and you make your money by this fee and you get a percentage of the interest rates? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, and then you use the Lee County tax collectors to collect your payments? We do. And mm -hmm. then we will reimburse them up to 2%. Mm -hmm. um, different counties have different rates. I don't know Lee County. I don't know if you guys You reimburse do. them. What do you mean? For their time and effort. Um, we're, we're authorized by state statute to reimburse them up to 2% of the entire assessment. Broward County, for example, does it for 0.11%. Palm Beach County does it mm -hmm. for 2%. I don't know where Lee came in, but the, we can reimburse them basically for their time and effort. Council, anything else? Any other questions? Sorry. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay, we're now going to move on to item D, presentation related to the Florida Accessibility Code, and this is green sheet 18050134. John Dolmer, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Mr. Mayor, we were requested to provide council some information on uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it is implemented in the city. And that generally, to cut to the chase, is through the Florida Accessibility Code. Uh, back in 1990, Americans with Disabilities Act was approved. I stole this piece of information from the EEOC website, which simply explains their role in the process and the intent. And it deals with the following areas. <clears throat> so when you start looking at accessibility, it starts talking about public uh, access. And these are the areas that are outlined within the accessibility code, knowing that they interpret these generally pretty broadly. It's not necessarily a narrow view of most of these type of uses. And some of them I paraphrased so they would fit onto this slide. Uh, know that there is some different language that is in the statute directly. And when you look at the statute's uh, construction as to what we're looking at for standards, the state of Florida uses uh, what the Department of Justice has established uh, from their 2010 ADA standards. And those are uh, the specifics that we'll get into in a second. Who handles the accessibility code? If you look at this section right here, the local government and code enforcement agency. So the way it, we've always interpreted that is when somebody comes in for a permit, regardless of whether it's new construction or whether it's a remodel, that would be someone in community development, whether engineering or building. When it comes to inspections in the field or looking at existing conditions, generally not only for this but for other items, that is code enforcement. New buildings are easy. They come into compliance with the code. It's existing buildings that have remodels or additions that really start to get a little more complicated and the rules become not, well, uh, unless you're really into them as clear. And what we've done is the state of Florida has outlined uh, newly designed, newly constructed buildings or portions of buildings. If you alter a building, that portion of the building that is altered, uh, a building that is converted from residential to non-residential or mixed use, and if a building or facility has not received applicable permits, then it must come into compliance. So those are what we're looking at when we're looking at existing buildings or remodels. And this is how we incorporate those standards into the Florida Building Code. And this is really where we start to get into the standards. Um, a lot of discussion with accessibility starts with handicap parking. And I try to use different colors so you could see. I don't know if it's really all that legible. But know that what we've done is uh, we've 
put a chart up here that puts a range of parking spaces. And for each of those ranges, the minimum number of handicapped spaces uh, that is required. Also, in addition to this, there is a van requirement. Uh, so if you only have one handicapped parking space, then you start looking at providing access for a van. This is the difference between a regular handicapped space and a van space. Handicapped space looks at a minimum of 96 inches, a van is 132, and then you have both of the access aisles that go directly onto the sidewalk or into the building. That ramp, assuming that there is a curb there, cannot be at any greater slope than 1 to 10. This kind of displays what I was talking about with existing buildings that have renovations. And what we're talking about are uh, added items. So this box would be an addition to an existing building. Any, anything that's within this new box would have to come into compliance with current standards. Uh, additions that affect the usability, so access into that box. Unaltered portions, if you see down here at the bottom, and spaces are generally not required to comply except as needed to provide an accessible path of travel to primary function areas affected by this addition. So this existing box would generally, I'm not going to say be exempt, but if it was constructed legally at the time, does not need to necessarily be altered. We always encourage people to alter them and to make them more accessible, but under the accessibility code is not required. These are also some standards if you're looking at access routes. As you can see, there's a lot of, of regulations. It's talking about passing zones. It's talking about minimum widths for uh, uh, doorways and access ways, uh, minimum height <coughs> for doorways, uh, maximum distance between passing zones. So what they're doing is controlling ways to get from essentially the front door to all public access areas. And this is what I have, have found. Uh, someone had done a pretty good job of providing all of the requirements uh, for bathrooms. And what you can see here, I'll just point out a few things, is the 5.8 by 5.8 requirement for, for uh, turnaround for wheelchairs, uh, minimum and maximum height for the commode seat, uh, for handrails, for the sink. This does not show a maximum reach uh, over the sink or any other obstacle to the wall. Uh, in a clear area in front of that sink for better access. There really isn't, I haven't put a whole lot more in here simply because this code is about two to three inches thick. There are a lot of sections in here that are, are crystal clear. There are other areas where we're talking about existing buildings or conversion of existing buildings or remodeling of existing buildings. It gets a little more complicated. So what I really wanted to do here was just kind of outline where did this come from? Where did the legislative history take place? How did it get down to the state of Florida? Then, now that it's here, what do we generally look at for those, I'll call them hot button issues, but uh, more frequent questions that we generally tend to address? Those are the, the handicapped spaces, those are access ways, uh, those are bathroom designs. Um, they're things that we look at as part of permits that come in our office every day. I know you've had public comment that says we don't have specific accessibility permits, and that's true. We don't have a specific permit just for accessibility. We process permits for remodels, for new, permit, uh, new construction, and as part of those, we enforce the standards of this statute. Um, one of the good things that's come out of this discussion is internally as staff, we've looked at better ways to do this because there's always better ways to handle these things. So, we're looking at revising some of our submittal requirements so that we get better information and can provide better information as part of the permit request. Uh, I know that there has been comments about specific businesses uh, at this podium, and right now we have permits in for a couple of them right now. So uh, I will say this discussion has taken us to, s to some positive places, and it has been a good conversation mm -hmm. to have. I mean, I don't know if there were specific topics that this council wanted to discuss, but I at least wanted to provide you some of the groundwork and the basic information of the, of the statute. Right, right, thank you. Fred. Yeah, I, I <coughs> would suggest <coughs> that we do a little more investigation on one, <coughs> one area that we kind of went over and said it's not a problem, and I think we need to uh, maybe even let Theriac, Audrey, both, whatever, and I think you may even want to get a get some input from the what's called the DOJ it's got a lot of 
both good and bad press lately. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm of the opinion it's the kind of reverse. If you got a building as public, the public has got access to it, you, you've got to bring it up to some minimum standards of accessibility, which is somewhat contrary to what, and I think we really need to check that out because the consequences are that if that would happen to be right and somebody brings a lawsuit, we'll get drug into it because we're kind of the enforcing authority and all that. It, it's better to check to be sure than to not, I know when I worked in Ohio, that other state, that backward state. <laughs> that state to the south? State, no, it's north yeah. of Michigan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the view was- South that, of Michigan. Yeah, if you were, if, anyway. you were, if you were, if you had a building that was public access, there were certain minimum accessibility requirements you had to meet. Now, I could be wrong, and I hope I am, but I, I think we wanna really double and triple check that. Yeah. No, and Fred, I would I would echo that because you know we we had um, a resident here uh, at, at meetings continues to be involved and is bringing, as John said, a very good discussion forward that needs to be had is overdue from being had right in in in, in some minds and uh, is 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 a law that continues to evolve a, a, as we go so. Uh, whereas everything we do in Bonita Springs is, is meant to address citizens' concerns and keep up with the times, this is no different. I wholeheartedly support your efforts. Carl, your efforts, Arlene, Audrey, myself, John, others that have been involved in these conversations, uh, meetings the past couple of weeks. Um, this is certainly not the end. It's the beginning as we know, or n not the beginning, but we're where we're responding in due time, in like time, in real time, and we'll continue to do so. And John, what, what, what are your thoughts moving forward, um, you know, in terms, of, and, and you've, re, you know, capped this nicely, but, uh, you know, to drill down and to keep moving forward, uh, kind of what is, what is the barometer, if you will? What is the, our line of demarcation, our line of success, and I know that's, probably a loaded vague question but I think well, you see what I'm trying to say here we hear from a number of sources um, I know that the city has worked with with um, uh, someone that has handled specific ADA issues and I've been playing phone tag with them for over a week now so unfortunately I wasn't able to give any any of their impressions uh, but I, I will keep tracking that down if there are issues that people have if there are questions that people have we're obviously willing to have conversations or answer questions in terms of how we're doing business and how we are taking this uh, these requirements forward one of the greatest weaknesses that I saw that we had was the amount of information or the type of information that's submitted with certain permits and it wasn't so much that we weren't looking to increase the accessibility consistent with the statute it was that some of the information that was provided was not adequate to make sure that we had done that so that in some cases we might have made different decisions than what we did so what we are doing now even going down as low as as uh, seal coat uh, restriping we're looking for additional information that somebody provide us in terms of uses and square footage and parking requirements and existing handicapped spaces and access into buildings um, also looking at additional information that be provided for interior remodel permits for multi-tenant structures and there's there's a handful of items that go along those lines uh, that will allow us a better view of a site uh, before we start making recommendations on on increased accessibility because really what the uh, I didn't really go into this but when we start looking at if someone comes in for an interior remodel permit we have up to about 20 percent of the value of that construction to place into uh, increased accessibility and so sometimes it's a lot of money sometimes it's not a lot of money and you really want to make sure that you create a situation that someone goes ahead with the remodel permits because there have been a couple of times it's very rare but it does happen that the cost of accessibility requirements just has somebody walk away from a permit say I'm not going to remodel because I don't want to spend I didn't have that much money to, to, to put into this project so what we're trying to do is make sure that when we are looking at increased accessibility one first and foremost we're consistent with all the standards that we have to have second one is to make sure that we've applied some common sense and try to get these projects to go forward 
and not lose any of them mid-permit. Council? Okay, wonderful. Thank, great job, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John, very much. Okay, uh, item eight, mayor and council member items. We're going to uh, item A, adopt a clear an aggressive timetable to enact our vision of Old 41 into land development requirements that benefit the almost $30 million expenditure of taxpayer money there. This is Deputy Mayor Peter O'Flynn, Green Sheet 18050139. Peter. I wonder if we could take a break for a little bit yeah. at the okay. three hour mark. Sure. May maybe even a break to get something to eat because I'm looking at this agenda and we've got two more yeah. hours here. Um, I got a three o'clock meeting so yeah. we can break away but yeah I mean we scramble maybe uh, convene at uh, 20 after 12 or something like that sure is that all right that's fine yeah okay all right we will uh, reconvene at 1220 thanks everybody Thanks.